Welcome. Good day, everyone. I'm Isabel Montañez, Chair of the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources, or what I'll refer to as Beezer. And I'd like to start by thanking you all for attending today's meeting. Today's focus is energy and resource needs for a nation in transition. We seek to learn more about the current energy and earth resources research priorities and how these priorities are positioned or evolving to address changing societal demands, to mitigate climate change, and to decrease adverse social inequities and environmental impacts. So after I give a brief overview of the Beezer mission and discuss the meeting protocols, we'll be hearing from our keynote speaker, Brian Anderson of the National Energy Technology Laboratory, as well as three panelists, Nicole Sand Saunders from the Environmental Defense Fund, Rebecca Hernandez from UC Davis, and Ben Holton, the Ronald P. Lynch Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Cornell University and co-chair of the California Collaborative for Climate Change Solutions. After each presentation, there'll be time for questions from the board and the audience. And we'll be taking a 15 minute break at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, after which time we will return for a panel discussion. Could I have the next slide, please, Eric? The Board on Earth Sciences and Resources is the National Academy's focal point for activities and issues relevant to the solid earth sciences and resources. It's one of 11 boards in the Division of Earth and Life Studies. And together, these boards comprise most of the national science portfolio of the academies. Other divisions cover engineering, policy, global affairs, and social sciences. Next slide, please. We cover a broad topical space, including a range of geologic hazards, energy and mineral resources and stewardship, geographic, geologic, and geospatial mapping and modeling, geological and geotechnical engineering, carbon sequestration and uh, energy transition, strategic directions for earth science research, the intersection of geology and health, environmental justice and equity in earth science, and education, workforce development and safety. And so clearly much of our work has important societal implications. Beezer's funding sources are diverse and showcase the breadth of earth sciences. Our core funding is currently supported by NSF's Division of Earth Sciences and the Geoscience Directorate, NASA's Earth Surface and Interior Focus Area, and DOE Basic Energy Sciences. USGS is a traditional sponsor with pending support. Could I have the next slide, please? So in order to keep our pulse on emerging topics and to help prioritize areas that might be of interest to our sponsors and other federal, federal agencies, we have a large board of volunteers. Uh, today, in the interest of time, I'll not be introducing the, the members and staff, but we present them here to acknowledge their contributions to the board. And I also invite you to look through the agenda booklet for more information on our members. And I'd like to mention that we also have a new director, Dr. Deborah Glickson who you see here, who oversees both the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources and the Water Science and Technology Board. Deb is a marine geologist who brings considerable experience to the board accrued over her tenure at the National Academy since 2008. And board members, please introduce yourself uh, when asking questions. So just a little bit about our Zoom logistics. Um, board members, please raise your hand, virtual hands to ask a question. Uh, we'll be monitoring the virtual hand raising and we will call on you. Audience members uh, will be taking questions through the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Please type your questions into the box at any time, click send, and uh, staff members will be monitoring the Q&A and passing these questions to the moderators. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. Any questions you submit may be read aloud and include in our recording. And a link to the recording will be posted on our website. So we're really, uh, next slide, please. We're pleased to have Brian Anderson as our kickoff speaker, who will be presenting Paving the Way to a Decarbonized Energy Future. Brian is the director of the Department of Energy's National Energy Technology Laboratory. And during his tenure at, at NETL, We've initiated critical technology development and deployment projects, including direct air capture technologies for decarbonization, chemical looping combustion with the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and non-variable renewable energy 
for future low carbon power systems. Brian's also guided the development and maturation of key technologies that are having significant industry impact, including microwave ammonia synthesis and carbon nanomaterials manufactured from coal. And Brian has just been named executive director of the White House Interagency Working Group on Coal and Power Plant Communities and Economic Revitalization. Jim Slutz, a, a Beezer member, will be moderating questions after Brian's talk. Thank you so much for joining us, Brian, and I turn the screen over to you now. Isabel, thank you so much, and, and the Beezer board, thank you for the opportunity to speak a little bit today about uh, at least NETL's role and, and a, um, a pathway toward decarbonization. Uh, as Isabel noted, um, I, I've also uh, even very recently been asked uh, by the White House to lead an interagency working group in coal and power plant communities, economic re revitalization. This is an 11 agency uh, interagency working group of spanning the entire federal government because of the acknowledgement of the fact that as we manage the energy transition, um, we have relied heavily on coal and, and natural gas and oil uh, for uh, more than a century in the United States. And uh, in those communities are in, have built their economies around um, the earth resources that they have. And so when we think of of the transition of the energy, uh, our energy system into the future, being able to manage the uh, the pathway and transition of these communities that are reliant on the earth resources themselves, how do we uh, how do we craft a, a pathway forward? And so uh, that's uh, part of the the role of the interagency working group is to try to identify uh, the pathways and opportunities for those communities. And some of them may, in fact, be technical solutions uh, like uh, I might I might present today. So I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen now and uh, um, jump into uh, jump into the talk. I think it's it's great to uh, uh, speak to the board board on Earth Sciences and Resources, uh, particularly because of the the breadth and and depth of the uh, the focus areas of Beezer. And I think that there's a real opportunity for us to, to rethink uh, our energy resources into the future, knowing that today, 80% of our primary energy comes uh, from the earth primarily. Uh, well, 80% comes from fossil energy. Uh, even higher value, higher number comes uh, from the earth when we consider uranium as a, as a primary energy source for, uh, for nuclear generation. And so when we consider how we're going to pay the path for a decarbonized energy future, uh, we have to include the, the subsurface. Uh, and, uh, and it's really inherent to all of the various pathways that we might envision of getting to a decarbonized energy future. To set the stage for the role of, of NETL and, and the federal government, at least the, the Department of Energy, uh, understanding that we have the Department of Energy National Laboratory system is important that um, we have our 10 science laboratories, uh, all shown uh, here in uh, the gray circles. These have our big user facilities, many of which have deep expertise in, in earth sciences and, and, uh, and resources. We have our three applied laboratories, the Idaho National Laboratory focused on nuclear, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado focused on renewable energy, and NETL, as you can see, we have laboratories in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Oregon, uh, with field offices in, in Alaska and Texas. Uh, historically, we focused on fossil energy, but uh, I, I would also add that for 25 years, we've been developing technologies for carbon capture and sequestration. So in fact, we are, we are the fossil energy and carbon management uh, laboratory is really our, our key focus area. And one thing to note uh, within our portfolio uh, is not just fossil energy, but uh, as the Department of Energy's loan government-owned, government-operated laboratory, we also steward some programs uh, across the board. So our mission, uh, which is actually recently recently revised mission of, of NETL, is to drive innovation and solutions for an environmentally sustainable and prosperous energy future. And it's right at the, the nexus of environmental sustainability and a prosperous energy future, where what we're focused on at NETL is to uh, set out the goals of, de of decarbonized energy system of the future, 
and doing it in a pathway that uh, uh, provides the optimal solution for the country, doing it as fast as we can um, and in a way that uh, um, decreases economic dislocation, uh, increases uh, energy justice and environmental justice uh, in communities that have been impacted and will continue to be impacted by an energy transition into the future, this is a really tough challenge um, to, to try to manage all of those goals simultaneously. And so we do it uh, by developing affordable and abundant reliable energy uh, through technologies that manage carbon across the full life cycle. And that is a, a really important component is to understand the full environmental impact costs of all energy production and be, being able to then manage and, and minimize the environmental uh, impacts, the negative environmental impacts, so that we can ensure environmental sustainability for all Americans. And this includes environmental justice uh, in communities that have been adversely impacted by uh, energy production in, in the past. Uh, it, it includes uh, energy justice and energy jobs uh, moving, moving forward in, into the future. And so um, the administration and, uh, and the National Laboratory System have set out some really aggressive goals and, and constraints along our energy transition pathway so that we can, we can try to have a just transition. And many of you have heard that terminology and really to dig into what it means is that we have integrated, looking at our vision, the, we have integrated solutions that include the trans, transition of an economy, the investment of infrastructure, uh, as well as the development of technologies that can achieve those missions of environmental sustainability and, and a prosperous energy future. And so NETL, you know, I, I, I say here, we're the only national lab dedicated to carbon research. And so that's carbon in the full life cycle through uh, historically a lot of work in production of natural gas and oil, including uh, work in, in the uh, uh, environmental, in, to increase the environmental sustainability of shale gas production and how we can convert uh, our carbon resources into higher value products and, and, uh, and then uh, provide opportunities for uh, uh, for resource rich communities so that they're not stuck with a resource curse. Uh, I think that's really important uh, in terms of adding value. So to get to know NETL in, in case you know I know many of you on the, on, on the webinar today are familiar with us, but to get to know us a little deeper, we have five core competencies in the Research and Innovation Center, which is our research arm. Uh, these are in computational science and engineering, materials engineering, geologic and environmental systems, which one would say is, the, is our Beezer arm, but, but in fact, um, our, our Beezer work, uh, work that's related to Beezer is computational science and material science, energy conversion engineering, and also in our strategic systems analysis and engineering. That includes the life cycle assessment work uh, that we do, as well as energy systems modeling across the whole, whole spectrum. And the, certainly the top two uh, horizontal lines in coal and carbon uh, and natural gas and oil are what we've worked on in our portfolio for over 100 years at our Pittsburgh facility and, and over 75 years in Morgantown and Albany. Um, but we also work very closely with energy efficiency and renewable energy, managing a, a significant portion of the vehicles program and geothermal and advanced manufacturing and buildings, the Office of Electricity and CSER, Cybersecurity, Energy Security and Emergency Response. So when you package all this together, we, we really try to take a holistic systems level approach to the energy system as a whole, integrated energy systems, and then how we can manage the pathway uh, of the energy transition to a decarbonized energy future. And so when we look at the specific application areas, I brought up life cycle analysis, which is the middle of the, uh, the nine boxes here, uh, which really is core to how we evaluate the energy transition, how we evaluate new technologies that will come on to be able to manage not just carbon across the life cycle, including all of its uh, um, potential emissions and greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse gases as a whole, but also the full environmental impact associated with energy production um, of all energy technologies. And therein comes uh, some of the things we'll talk about later today in critical materials, uh, critical minerals, rare earth elements, and things like that. And then the other a whole suite of, of technologies that, that, uh, that we work on in chemical recycling. Um, it was mentioned in the intro, microwave catalysis, being able to lower energy barriers to even manufacturing processes, 
material synthesis, gasification, hydrogen uh, processing and, and, uh, and hydrogen distribution and hydrogen production as a, as a potential uh, lever to decarbonization uh, as, a, as an energy carrier down, down the future. And so uh, again, our leadership in life cycle assessment uh, really drives a lot of our uh, decisions and investments in, in research of technologies of how to decarbonize our, our energy future. So this comes in, I, I mentioned the strategic systems analysis and engineering. Uh, when it comes to the life cycle assessment, techno, uh, techno-economic assessments, uh, and then the impacts of research investments on the goals uh, that we've set forth for the, the aggressive targets of decarbonization, understanding the pathways that we can move along the, the entire energy system portfolio uh, to, again, aggressively tackle, uh, tackle the climate crisis to develop technologies to reduce the carbon impact uh, and, and full greenhouse gas impact of our energy technologies uh, and doing it in a way that uh, one can imagine a multivariable optimization process where uh, a constraint might be the goal of decarbonized electricity sector by 2035, fully decarbonized net zero uh, economy by 2050 but doing it across a set of decisions over these next 20 uh, or 30, 29 years uh, that uh, minimize any negative economic impacts as well as optimizing uh, the opportunities of energy communities is, is really the grand challenge that we're working on, not just at NETL, but across the entire national laboratory system. So we think of the pathways to decarbonization. Here's just, just a sampling of some of the uh, scenarios for CO2 abatement and mitigation and, and minimization of the energy system globally. Uh, we look at the International Energy Agency, BP's net zero uh, pathway, BP's business as usual pathway there in green, uh, EIA's examples, ExxonMobil's um, uh, scenario, and then the rapid decarbonization uh, example from BP. And if we look at these particular targets um, they all require very aggressive and very near-term uh, action. And certainly uh, those, those actions have been taken. If you look at the trend line from 2000 down to, down to 2020, there's uh, US-related CO2 emissions that have been decreasing and, and frankly, in large part to simultaneously uh, deploying um, zero emitting renewables as well as a tremendous shift in the power generation uh, fleet from coal into natural gas. We know that uh, you know back uh, in, in just just uh, over a decade ago, we were producing about 52% of our electricity from uh, from coal. Today, it's 24%, uh, uh, with a large part of that shift going into natural gas and decrease in the emissions. But that certainly opens up as as the folks at EDF um, uh, have uh, very uh, capably examined that has the potential of leading to uh, methane emissions uh, through the transportation uh, and distribution of, of natural gas, which is again, a major challenge that, uh, that's part of our portfolio is the um, uh, methane uh, emission estimates as well as mitigation targets. So anyway, you put, you put it all together and we need some very aggressive pathways to decarbonization to get to a net zero economy in 2050 shown only by the BP net zero uh, example here on this, this particular set of six scenarios. So when we look at how we're going to uh, build those decarbonization scenarios, uh, again, just one example of the pathway, the uh, set of wedges of decarbonization uh, as illustrated by the International Energy Agency, uh, which uh, very graciously allowed David Turk uh, to step away from the IEA and join us uh, in the Department of Energy as the Deputy Secretary recently. Uh, but the IEA has shown um, all of the pathways include and certainly lots of electrification of the transportation sector as well as the industrial uh, sector, which is often overlooked when we talk about decarbonization pathways. Uh, other renewables in addition to uh, hydrogen, well, hydrogen is an energy carrier, not necessarily renewable, but the uh, bioenergy, uh, wind, solar, technology performance to drive down or to drive efficiency. Um, they all require uh, the onset of carbon capture utilization and sequestration 
at some uh, point in onset. And you can see that uh, right now there's a, a lot of uh, deployment of renewables. And then certainly when we consider some of the constraints specific to the electrical grid and increased demand of the electrical grid through electrification of industrial and transportation sectors uh, requires us to be able to deploy low or, or zero carbon on demand uh, on demand power generation, firm power uh, that can uh, provide uh, the um, uh, resilience of the grid that, that we, we so require. Now, certainly there's been a lot of discussion around uh, uh, the uh, polar vortex in Texas earlier this year and in regards to uh, um, the, uh, the blame or the share of blame that, that uh, would be borne by all of the different uh, components of the system uh, under a very uh, unique and, and uh, a rare uh, a polar vortex in Texas. Uh, but it, it does come down often to uh, the structure of the market. And so when we think of all of the technology solutions that we have at our disposal, uh, be it uh, load following and, uh, and uh, on-demand power, uh, in fact, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the um, post-mortem on the Texas incident comes down to the fact that there was the reserve margin that was low and the structure of the market and, and, uh, and the lack of a capacity market. And so we can come up with all of the technologies that can solve uh, many of our energy problems at low cost, uh, but they all require some policy drivers uh, or market solutions and market structures that are often not uh, driven uh, by, by technologies, in fact. And so uh, again, when we look at the, the various uh, decarbonization scenarios, we do see a, a very strong need for uh, the entire geosciences uh, community to step up, not just in, in CCUS for sure, uh, but in the sustainable pathways of producing critical materials, reducing the rare earth elements, uh, that we need to uh, to power the renewable economy, and then uh, also cer certainly advanced batteries and, and the, the the great um, geologic needs associated with uh, materials and and driving sustainability across all of the sectors, including you know say cobalt production in, in the Congo uh, as one example. So when we uh, consider all of the different uh, technology pathways, as we mentioned, we Historically at NETL, we've have done uh, baseline life, life cycle analysis, retrofit studies for coal and natural gas for power. But as we're moving into uh, a rapid decarbonization of our energy system, we are, we are now expanding our, our analyses to include certainly negative emissions technologies. It was mentioned in the intro about director capture uh, as one of the levers that will need to be pulled uh, when we get to deep decarbonization of those hard to decarbonize segments of, of the economy, particularly around the industrial sector, uh, where there are really difficult components of our economy to decarbonize, that we will need negative emissions technologies, including biomass energy with CCS, that's a DEX, uh, um, and uh, director capture uh, as levers to pull for us to get to a full net zero. And this is certainly in addition to uh, what the, the pathway for, uh, for our existing coal fleet uh, with accelerating retirements in the near future, uh, as well as natural gas that is currently being deployed at a, a very high rate uh, in, in the United States and how we can uh, retrofit or even develop technologies that would be deployed in real time uh, on the coal fleet and the natural gas fleet uh, so that we understand uh, how, to, how to navigate navigate the uh, um, decarbonization pathway. And then uh, when we're uh, targeting decarbonization of the entire economy, we must look at the industrial sector, uh, particularly some of the uh, heavy industry that has a very large CO2 footprint like cement. Uh, I'm glad to see we're going to have some enhanced weathering discussion later, uh, later in this uh, meeting today, as well as um, uh, the opportunity for hydrogen production and then again, life cycle assessment, as you can see, there's a, there's a theme. So to give you an update of where we are in terms of carbon capture and sequestration technologies, uh, looking across the, across the spectrum from natural gas and industrial capture, um, there's a lot of advances beyond the uh, traditional deployed amine um, 
uh, amine sorbent and solvent uh, uh, processes that uh, have, have been matured through the chemical industry or have been deployed on a demonstration basis from uh, coal burning power plants. But when we look at some of the challenges and opportunities for capture of different um, uh, different CO2 rich streams, like an industrial industrial capture, often often we do we have uh, high compositions of CO2 in the streams. Not like in natural gas, where we we might have seven percent CO2, coal being fourteen percent. We may have fifty percent CO2 in some industrial streams, and so a, a whole suite of technologies to be able to uh, capture carbon at low cost uh, has been has been our our focus. In the direct air capture space, uh, um, we have started uh, work in computational screening. Um, the, this is, has, on, has been ongoing. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of, our, uh, one of our projects, we were able to screen over a million combinations of a um, polymer organic framework with, uh, um, well, with molecular organic framework in a composite material with polymers. We screened over a million different types of materials, identifying four out of a million, talk about a needle out of, out of a haystack, to identify four that uh, showed pro great promise and decrease in cost of, of capture uh, using uh, a hollow fiber uh, sorbent. Uh, and we've also been developing this uh, bias sorbent, which uh, in fact is a, a particular type of material that can not only absorb CO2, but matter of fact, it's pretty useful to absorb uh, things like lead in drinking water uh, and even rare earths, as it, as it turns out. And so in the director capture space, it is about capturing from a very low concentration, 400 parts per million, uh, but we see a glide path for some of the costs of carbon capture and direct air capture, not to, not to reach the, the low levels of uh, $30 per ton. That's our target for uh, capture from industrial sources and, and coal and natural gas, uh, but still some, some uh, lower costs of capture that can come on again to uh, offset some of the hard to decarbonize uh, parts of the economy. Another big area is uh, in, in using hydrogen as an energy carrier, where today uh, the bulk, the vast majority in the 90, 90 percentile uh, of uh, hydrogen that's on the market today is produced from, uh, from fossil resources, uh, most of it from natural gas. If we uh, can drive down the costs again of carbon capture for uh, hydrogen, creating blue hydrogen, uh, then we have an energy carrier that's not carrying carbon with it. Uh, and uh, again, a, a tremendous potential uh, to, to not only have uh, hydrogen as an energy carrier and possibly a transportation sector, uh, but certainly parts of the hard to decarbonize industrial sector like steel manufacturing, for instance, there are options at the disposal of substituting, uh, substituting hydrogen in for carbon rich uh, uh, steel for, uh, for iron ore reduction. And then uh, a program that was kicked off um, a couple of years ago in Coal First. Uh, Coal First is about flexible, uh, innovative, resilient, small and transformative technologies that are net zero uh, CO2 emissions, or even in some instances net negative with biomass uh, that are driving toward a modular small um, small energy production with uh, uh, modular CO2 capture uh, that could possibly be deployed uh, in the um, uh, coal and power plant communities replacing uh, CO2 emitting uh, energy generation. So as a goal for our whole uh, integrated CCUS program, carbon capture and carbon storage, uh, as you see on the, on the timeline, we are uh, rapidly approaching integrated CCS projects to be deployed. And these are uh, the second generation CCS technologies uh, that uh, have, been, have been demonstrated at uh, the laboratory scale, scaled up at uh, a, a test facility called NCCC, the National Carbon Capture Center in Wilsonville, Alabama, uh, sometimes deployed in, in Mondstadt, Norway uh, for scale up. And then uh, again, going back to the, the need for policy drivers, 45Q as the tax credit for uh, CCS projects is providing a, a bit of the market pull for technologies to then be uh, deployed uh, by, by 2025. Now, we then are driving toward transformational technologies uh, deploying over the next 10 years. Uh, these transformational technologies 
and have cost drivers driving down the cost of carbon capture uh, to $30 per ton of metric ton of CO2 or even lower. And one of the real challenges is understanding uh, how the CO2 will be sequestered in the subsurface. And we have spent uh, many years with partnerships across the, across the United States to first characterize the potential for CO2 sequestration in the subsurface. Secondly, the potential for permanence of the CO2 in the subsurface. Uh, third, to reduce the risk, uh, that risk being uh, risk of leakage, uh, risk of uh, induced seismicity, uh, for large-scale uh, carbon capture and sequestration. And uh, as, as we see, we're integrating uh, the CCS projects regionally. We have uh, the regional partnerships as well as programs called Carbon Safe, uh, which is about the safe storage, long-term storage, permanent storage of CO2 in the subsurface. And, uh, and we, have a, we, we really are starting to have a, a great understanding of the potential in the subsurface. And now, uh, we, we would need uh, all of the surface infrastructure in place, be it CO2 pipelines uh, and, uh, and um, uh, the carbon capture system as a whole. Going back to the understanding that, uh, you know, everything from the EIA predictions of uh, what the pathway to decarbonization would include, uh, in order to have full deep decarbonization of our energy system, while maintaining the constraints around resiliency and reliability and the ability to have firm net zero power on the grid, uh, we, we do need to deploy CCUS uh, in, in the subsurface. All right, so changing, uh, slightly changing um, uh, the focus, uh, but uh, the application still being the same, we have kicked off an institute called the Science-Based Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Institute uh, which its focus uh, in SAMI is uh, really it's about physics-based, or here you can say science-based, artificial intelligence and machine learning to where instead of uh, historically, and this is not a knock on data science or artificial intelligence or machine learning, um, but to date, most of the algorithm development uh, in AI and machine learning and, and large data analytics have been focused mostly around empirical models and using uh, the structure of the algorithms and the learning algorithms in, in the computational science space uh, focused on in, empirical models, uh, even using neural networks and, and uh, um, you know, smart learning algorithms that are not always uh, driven around uh, science-based uh, science -based models. And so our focus is to bring the science-based models and the subject matter experts on the physics of a system to uh, the data scientists and, and computational scientists uh, to have this focus on, on physics-based models coupled with the artificial intelligence strategy. And so uh, the, the whole logo soup around the top are a number of the different uh, projects or, or platforms that, that we have used or across the national lab system uh, have used to try to drive towards physics-based and, and science-based artificial intelligence machine learning. Uh, the top left one, you see there is SMART, that's, that's specifically on the subsurface. I'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more. Um, but then uh, other, other examples, one in particular right in the middle, bottom, EDX, the Energy Data Exchange, is a data platform with uh, SMART algorithms built into it for uh, how the data come in and adding metadata uh, so that these data-rich environments are informed uh, by, uh, by the situational awareness of, of data collection. And then one other particular example, IDEAS, which is uh, on the bottom row, the fourth one over. IDEAS is our Institute for Design of Advanced Energy Systems. And, uh, and like the others, like SMART and, and EDX and Extreme Map, this is a collaboration of multiple national laboratories. It's Berkeley National Lab, PNNL, um, Sandia, uh, Los Alamos, NETL, uh, and this uh, and and some um, uh, academics like uh, Carnegie Mellon University. This is a entire platform built uh, to be able to bring in science-based models, uh, couple it across time and link scale, and ideas can in fact uh, simulate all the way down to a, a, a material in a power plant, up to uh, how the grid um, works on a day-to-day, -day, five minute ahead grid market so we can understand the effects of cycling on the grid uh, on the materials themselves within a power plant. 
And so that uh, to move from those time and link scales uh, is really a tremendous, tremendous breakthrough. So we have some uh, platforms I've mentioned EDX. Uh, we have our, our Joule supercomputer uh, and our Watt Center for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning. Watt's actually the name of the computer itself. Uh, that is uh, focused on data science. And uh, in particular, and on the next slide, I'm gonna talk about data science and subsurface. It is specific, Watt is specifically designed for very fast ingestion of data and the ability to analyze across huge data sets uh, in, in rapid time. And, uh, and, and we're at the point in, in human uh, computational uh, systems that we, we don't understand how big 16 petabytes are. Uh, in fact, 16 petabytes would store the Library of Congress, the world's largest data collection, would store the Library of Congress 1,023 times. And the speed at which we can ingest that data, if you took the Library of Congress, um, printed it out on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper, one inch margins, 10 point font, double sided and cheap paper. It would, it would stretch from Washington DC to St. Louis and we can read it in about four miles per second uh, is how fast we can, we can read and, and analyze, not just read, but analyze that data. And this is important because the data sets we're facing in the subsurface are, are becoming uh, very large, uh, very large yet often sparse. And so that presents some interesting computational challenges that we're trying to attack uh, in the SMART initiative. So the SMART initiative is how we can use science-based in artificial intelligence and machine learning to accelerate, accelerate an understanding of subsurface processes. And so you can see we have a pretty broad technical team all focused on how we can we can better adapt our understanding of processes that happen in the subsurface, everything from subsurface chemistry to fluid flow, even to uh, the propagation of hydraulic fractures. Uh, and the application space is in uh, carbon sequestration as well as uh, uh, oil and gas production and, uh, and the long-term ramifications of, of CO2 storage. Another area of unlocking the potential in the subsurface by using data-driven assessment methods. Uh, and this is largely driven out of our uh, Albany laboratory with our uh, pretty deep geospatial data analytics capabilities, is a new method to assess the rare earth, uh, rare earth element um, uh, potential within sedimentary environments. So that's already said. And so it's this geoda geodata science-driven approach so that we can assess rare earths in coal and, and other sedimentary environment systems uh, so that we can understand and identify the potential for extraction of rare earths uh, from our uh, existing resources, as well as our environmental remediation opportunities, uh, be it acid mine drainage sludge uh, or ash ponds that, that contain a significant amount of rare earth elements that could be uh, driven into our, our U.S. supply chain of rare earths that are so critical to everything from uh, the permanent magnets in, in wind turbines and electric vehicles uh, to um, our GPS systems and our cell phones. And so this uh, uh, is a, a real challenge given uh, the current status of, um, of the supply chain. And so we're trying to uh, unlock the promising resources using artificial intelligence and machine learning from historical and geologic data, understanding not just uh, the current status, but geologic processes that would have led to the concentration of rare earth elements in the subsurface. So the geologic processes at uh, the basin scale, uh, all the way through uh, the, the mapping of the sedimentary environment, uh, through geologic history uh, to today's state, and then con confirmed by sampling. And we, we've just entered a partnership with the USGS uh, where we are sharing all of our data that we have across the entire, uh, the entire federal government in, in the subsurface to understand how we can unlock uh, new resources for rares and other critical materials. And so it, it scales all the way from uh, the you know, SEM scale, you can see from the micron scale up to uh, basin scale mapping uh, and uh, modeling of the geologic processes uh, in the sedimentary environments. So our portfolio in the rare earth space uh, spans across really the entire supply chain, uh, extraction pathways of extracting rare earths and, and other critical materials, uh, critical minerals, as well as field tests and pilot validation, 
uh, scaling up uh, and uh, understanding the possibility of moving uh, moving the market in the United States and and the life cycle assessment again not just for this is not just CO2 emissions this is the full environmental impact cost of the production of our rares and critical critical minerals uh, so that we can uh, ultimately build into the potential for new material discovery new alloy development and uh, and certainly opportunities for demand growth in uh, rare earths and, and critical elements. These are you know, some of the examples of where we use uh, these uh, rare earth elements across uh, the entire supply chain. And certainly as we drive down uh, the decarbonization pathway over the next 29 years, as I, as I said, um, we are going to have an increased demand for uh, these rare earths and critical elements. So not just the need to understand how to extract, how to extract cleanly in environmentally friendly ways, how to purify alloy, uh, but then ultimately end of life and, and recycle are all critical uh, to our pathway uh, for, for decarbonization. And so um, my goal was to leave some time today for, for discussions, questions. I, I know that uh, uh, there's an audience uh, that I, I hope we have a, a, really, a really good discussion. And so I'm just going to close with uh, the fact that we can we cannot do any of the work we do at NETL or the interagency working group across 11 agencies without a robust portfolio of partnerships. Uh, we at NETL have over 600 partnerships and a thousand different R&D projects across the country. It, it is in every all 50 states, uh, and uh, and certainly it is uh, the benefit of all of these project partners. Uh, that uh, we have the opportunity in front of us to, uh, to decarbonize. And so I'm glad that we have such a robust partner set. And there are many different ways because I mentioned we were the go, a go-go laboratory. We issue funding opportunity announcements. We also partner in cooperative research and development agreements and small business uh, innovative research agreements. And, and so there's a whole plethora of ways uh, that we want to get engaged uh, with, with partners across the country. And so with that, I'm going to uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity for me to um, you know, speak about what I wanted to talk about today. Um, but I really look forward to engaging uh, conversations so uh, we, can, we can see where we go uh, in the conversation and, and, and open it up to questions. So thank you very much. Hi, Brian. Uh, this is Jim Slutes, a member of Beezer, and uh, thanks so much for that, uh, that great opening uh, and uh, really great stage setter for this whole uh, discussion on research and the, the energy transition. Um, so a quick reminder to folks, uh, the members of the board that are, that are on the uh, that that are that we can see you uh, you can use the uh your raise the hand and we'll call on you if you have a question to ask and those on the uh, webinar if you would just uh type your question into the uh the q and a box we'll we'll get to as many questions as we can we have a nice uh, set of time here for discussion so this is great um just while we're getting kind of things lined up uh Brian, let me kick us off. You kind of did quite a bit of uh, discussion there on the end on critical minerals and that's kind of a, and materials, that's kind of a, a key current issue uh, within this board uh, is our committee on earth resources. We're in the middle of a, a webinar series on critical materials. And I, I saw recently that uh, NETL uh, uh, issued a significant funding announcement for critical minerals uh, related to coal mine uh, waste and, and recovering min, uh, minerals from, uh, from, from coal related issues. And, uh, and so I was wondering, because part of the thing is we look at this and, and, and I, I'd be remiss without uh, mentioning, you mentioned IEA, IEA released a new report on critical minerals, which is, is quite eye-opening for those that haven't seen it on the challenges of what is the demand in the future and how do we meet it? Um, but it raises the issue because we know there's, and, and NETL does a lot, but it, it's, it's not always clear for those of us that work on this, where in the federal government 
this critical minerals issue both is is managed and looked at. We know USGS tracks kind of current, you know, a lot of information. But from a research perspective, because it's going to be more and more important, is this going to be a is this an evolving area where DOE is expanding broader beyond just some of the traditional areas? Do you is there is there more of a government wide initiative on this? Is there stuff you can share on how we might look at this from a U.S. government? Uh, managing the critical minerals and particularly research. Uh, Jim, that, that's great. And so in, in uh, um, the, so the Department of Energy interests are um, are twofold. I mean, one within the, the fossil energy space as well as geothermal. Uh, so this is the, the earth resources uh, space within the department. Uh, we have identified that there is an opportunity for uh, a resource base of, of rare earths and critical materials. And so the Geothermal Technologies Office has had, a, uh, had some efforts in the past that they've funded for extraction of, of critical minerals from uh, geothermal brines and things like that. Um, we identified within the fossil energy space that these sedimentary environments of, of coal uh, have some increased levels, particularly the heavy rare earths. And so our focus has been of being able to leverage the, the resources side but then uh, when I say that the critical minerals uh, effort of the department is twofold, it's because within the energy efficiency and renewable energy space, knowing that uh, the demand for critical minerals in, uh, in the renewables development uh, is so high, there's also uh, a real focus on how we can increase uh, critical minerals and rare earth elements uh, into that supply chain for, uh, for renewables deployment. And so that's really the, the uh, breadth of uh, rare earths and critical minerals as a focus within the Department of Energy. We did just stand up uh, the uh, Division of Minerals Sustainability uh, within the Office of uh, Fossil Energy. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of work over in, in the ERE. Now the whole government approach, we have uh, worked with some of our partners, uh, certainly in, in the interior and in USGS, as, as I had mentioned, uh, understanding the resource base as a whole uh, and uh, in, in Department of Defense, frankly, uh, because of their supply chains. Uh, but the technologies that we're working on are, uh, there's a merge point within a supply chain of moving it from a resource, say an acid mine drainage sludge, you make a rare earth oxide. And then once you have a rare earth oxide, uh, the supply chain really converges with almost any any uh, source of rare earths that you would you would have, be it mountain pass uh, as a, a historical rare earth mine. And uh, our focus then is on the environmental sustainability of the process of purifying and alloying uh, in, into the final metal. So um, I think we're, we're doing a, quite a bit of work uh, across the whole supply chain in that respect, but it's not covering the whole federal government. Thanks, Brian. Hey, one of the questions that came in, I, we have a couple board members to go to and I'll go to them in just a second, but but I see one of the questions is a personal favorite of uh, that I, I particularly resonates with me that someone's asked because Brian, you and I and probably very few others have been to Albany, Oregon. Yeah. And so when somebody and and realize what a jewel that facility is. Yeah. And so um, can you share a bit more about the focus and efforts taking place at the Albany, Oregon lab? And I think I think this is a great opportunity for you to champion a little bit of that because uh, I just it was one of the, the my favorite field visits uh, when I was at DOE years ago. Yeah. Uh, no, thanks for teeing that one up. Um, so in Albany, I'll start historically, I'm not going to go through the whole history, but uh, during the Second World War, the Albany, Albany Research Laboratory was uh, founded to work on uh, new metals, metals and metal alloys. Uh, over the course of the, the last 75 years, the Albany Research Facility has spun out a whole specialty metals alloy industry in that part of West Central Oregon. And so our focus is still on uh, advanced alloys, advanced alloy processing. We have really unique facilities to be able to scale up uh, and develop new materials and, and new metals in particular in the alloying. But more recently, we've expanded a lot of the research we do in Albany to include that geospatial data analytics. So we have this great team, huge team uh, called Gaia, uh, which is a, a, a geologic, da a, a geospatial data analytics team 
uh, they're focused in Albany and, and uh, just tremendous assets there. So while Albany is the smallest of our three laboratory facilities, uh, it does have, still continues to have great impact. And one of the, one of the great inventions out of the Albany laboratory, in addition to you know, lots of metals uh, over the course of the years, but was actually uh, is, is a, um, a biocompatible uh, metal heart stent uh, that is in use all across the world, uh, patents in Japan and the United States, and, and, uh, and is credited with saving many, many uh, hundreds, if not millions of lives uh, as, a, as a biocompatible uh, metal heart stent. Th thanks, Brian. Yeah, and and just uh, if I could just add one thing because it's it's one is the other lives they've saved is is the current state of the art body armor used by uh, by the U.S. military, which is a huge national uh, uh, defense and and uh, uh, accomplishment. So uh, let's go to a couple board members. Uh, first, we have Rob uh, Bob Kleinberg. Uh, Bob. Bob, you need to unmute there. Okay, there we go. Uh, hello, Brian. Very nice to see you again. Good to see you, Bob. Um, and now I understand what 16 petabytes <laughs> is. I never really quite was able to visualize that. Um, but the, the question I want to ask is um, about seasonal energy storage. Right now, the United States uses something like 5% of its natural gas production to sort of level the load between summer and winter consumption of energy. It seems to me that that's only going to grow um, as renewables become more important. Um, we don't get much solar energy here in Boston uh, during the winter. So do you have an, an outlook as to how we're going to decarbonize and maybe expand our um, seasonal energy storage? I think that's a, that's a, a really good point, Bob. And, and not only... Um... Well, so the, the quick answer is no, I don't have a great handle on it at the moment. Uh, we're still working on it. That's the, the short answer. Um, but what, one additional complexity is uh, not just with, with seasonal energy storage um, that would be enhanced and increased by uh, deeper, dependent, deeper solar penetration uh, uh, on a seasonal basis, but then on a daily basis as that, uh, that big trend line grows then the, the daily variation will grow uh, as well. And so uh, even higher variations. And so that is one thing that we, we still have to manage. And, and so right now, um, I mean, not to, not to paint a bleak picture, uh, but the, uh, the natural gas infrastructure is, particularly in the Northeast, is operating on a pretty fine edge um, when it comes to delivering natural gas on demand um, in the winter time. Um, when uh, power, power plant needs uh, increase, but yet homes are, are heated with natural gas. And so it's all part of a very complex problem, which uh, any imbalance uh, creates you know, possible, possible issues that we saw just a couple of years ago in, in Michigan under my, in MISO when one natural gas compressor plant uh, went down, or compressor station went down, uh, that ended up resulting in about 12 uh, automotive facilities shutting down because it knocked out power. And, uh, and so we, are, we operate the energy system at very tight margins. And as we drive aggressively to decarbonization, it's gonna throw off a lot of the balances that we have to just manage. We have to be out in front and have to manage them very actively um, in order to maintain the resiliency that we, that we require. Right, well, I certainly urge you to uh, keep that in the forefront of your mind. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Rod Ewing. Right. Uh, uh, Brian, thank you very much for the interesting talk and uh, the comprehensiveness of, of the, the presentation. That said, and even though what you've presented is a pretty sweeping portfolio of research topics and charges, uh, how does NETL interact with other sources of renewable energy, their support within DOE? And in particular, I'm interested in the absence of any mention of nuclear energy. 
Well, the absence of uh, mentioning a nuclear is just simply uh, that uh, we, don't, we don't manage any of that portfolio. It's all uh, out of the Idaho lab. Um, but uh, the nuclear uh, is, you know, I, I, I just, I may have absolutely not mentioned it, but it has to be a critical part of the portfolio. Um, under, you know, zero carbon scenarios, it is uh, the one no car zero carbon emitting um, firm power that uh, on, on the market today. And so um, it, it certainly advances in, in small modular reactors to allow some flexibility and the possibility for load falling is a huge direction of, of the Office of Nuclear Energy uh, to, to contribute to the portfolio. And then uh, driving down costs and, and inherently lead time for uh, permitting and building uh, nuclear reactors on our fleet. Uh, and then, and then the, the, um, uh, the social acceptance uh, to come along with that as well uh, is critically important for us to, to, as a part of the portfolio to decarbonization. I mean, I, that's kind of an opinion. Um, the facts are that there's a huge portfolio in the nuclear space uh, in the Office of Nuclear Energy that I, I, my apologies, I didn't touch on today. Just, just a quick follow-up. Uh, one of the centerpieces of what you're doing is the life cycle analysis. And of course, within nuclear energy and DOE, that's a big question. Is there a process by which uh, uh, the life cycle analysis for nuclear and other energy resources is compared as, and for the well, purpose of developing policy? So, so in, sh in short, yes. Um, and so a, a major part of the portfolio in the Office of Nuclear Energy is, is the uh, stewardship of the life cycle of, of the nuclear material, the fissionable material, uh, and in particular waste. And, and it does get into very sensitive uh, topics around, I mean, political topics around the storage of waste in places like Yucca Mountain and, and, and the like. And, and so uh, it is a critical part of uh, the assessment of the department, department as a whole under the Undersecretary for Science and Energy, uh, where fossil and renewables and nuclear all sit. Uh, and so, um, it is, a, it is a, a critical part. Now, it, it, it becomes diff difficult because there are some apples to oranges when it comes to you know, uh, managing nuclear waste over its entire life cycle to managing carbon over its entire life cycle. Uh, they're different to com difficult to compare one, one to another, and that's where there's a lot of uh, social policy and, and uh, um, you know, social equity questions that come up. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Rod. Hey, hey, Brian, we just have a few minutes left. So what I'm going to do, if you're okay, we'll do, do some of these questions more like a lightning round. I'll just, I'll, I'll touch on a few different questions. And then maybe you can do some wrap up comments to try to address those. And so we'll, uh, there's one about efforts to decarbonize over, you know, over a 30 year period. And, and are there, um, what do you see as, as kind of critical policy actions that might be needed to implement those? Let me, let me add to that. Or what are some of the critical path items in research maybe as well, I think would be of interest to people that you're seeing. And then there's a question about, um, it, it's, it's under methane sequestration, but I think the broader, you know, methane is getting a lot of attention. The UN issued a report last week about it. You know, what, what some of the, a little bit more on your, you know, methane reduction in some of the technology areas. And, and, and then the, uh, the final issue is the broader then, then is uh, these transformative technologies and sometimes government, the government regulations don't really accommodate new technology well. So kind of a pathways on regulation that may be that interface between technology and regulation. So three things kind of critical, critical policy and or research, methane and, uh, and regulation. Yeah. So I'm going to lump uh, the policy and regulation together. Is that we needed it? We we do need a comprehensive uh, energy policy framework. Um, that uh, you know right now, so we have a combination of investment tax credits and production tax credits. 45Q looks kind of like a production tax credit uh, when you compare it to uh, um, the PTCs on on wind and and solar. Uh, so really, a, a real comprehensive uh, policy portfolio that touches on investing in technologies to move them over the barrier, but then uh, we certainly don't have a policy framework for 
uh, the pathway reduction of, of CO2 as a whole. So we need that. Um, that includes, that policy framework needs to include uh, the ability in the regulatory environment to be able to permit new, new projects uh, um, more rapidly, particularly if, if we uh, see that uh, CO2 sequestration is necessary, uh, we will have interstate pipelines of CO2 and, and the ability to uh, permit that and move, move it forward using existing, uh, existing rights of way. Uh, technologies that we need, uh, certainly grid scale storage is, uh, remains one of the big, the big issues to uh, be able to handle uh, the hour by hour variability of increasing variable renewables on, onto the grid. In addition to, uh, you know, I, I think that CCUS is a, a critical pathway. Uh, once we get to 60 or 70% decarbonization, uh, we really must have CCUS technologies ready to go. So then we have long lead term items uh, in order to be ready for that. And that includes a lot of the infrastructure that needs to get out front. And then, um, uh, oh shoot, I missed the one in the middle. What was the one? Oh, methane. Oh, uh, methane. So in terms of methane. Uh, you know, we have a pretty robust portfolio in detection of methane. Uh, so uh, across the entire uh, infrastructure portfolio to be able to detect where it is, uh, categorize and, and measure and quantify methane emissions, as well as new technologies for uh, even converting a natural gas uh, compressor stations, as well as new materials uh, to, to mitigate methane. Now, in terms of, you know, the question on sequestration of methane, we store, as Bob mentioned, we store uh, methane, natural gas, underground, uh, as it is today. Uh, but in fact, if you capture the methane, you would end up using it. Uh, you know, if, if met methane is a climate forcing gas, is much stronger than CO2. So it's actually better to burn it, uh, burn it, and capture the CO2 and get the energy out of it than than perhaps sequester it. Well, Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for this great kickoff, and let's let's all give Brian a virtual uh, round of applause applause for this great opening. Uh, appreciate it. We'll look forward to uh, staying engaged with you, Brian, and NETL. And uh, I know I know the, uh, the board and all of our committees, as well as other places in the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine really uh, consider the NETL relationship uh, critical. All right. I, I thank you for the opportunity. And uh, with that, uh, let me uh, let me uh, hand oh, hand the uh, the uh, the mic over to uh, Brenda Bowen, who is going to uh, moderate our, our next panel today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jim. So we have a great panel lined up for today where we'll be exploring the land and water impacts and trade-offs of the energy transition that we've been talking about. We'll hear about produced water, about renewable energy sustainability, and enhanced weathering. Speakers will touch on resource needs, industry relevance, environmental impacts, and connections to communities. After each speaker is done, we'll have a few minutes for questions. And so please feel free to enter your questions into the, into the Q&A as we're hearing their, their presentations. Um, and then we will take a short break and then come back together for a full panel discussion with the, with the whole group. So we'll begin our panel with Nicole Saunders. Nicole is a senior attorney with the Environmental Defense Fund in their energy program. Her work is devoted to ensuring that science-based regulations, policies, and industrial practices are in place to reduce human health and environmental impacts from energy development. She focuses on the management and disposal of oil and gas wastewater, as well as policies to ensure environmental integrity in emerging carbon capture and sequestration projects. Nicole, thank you for being with us here today, and I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you so much. I'm going to um, share my screen quickly. Can you all see slide one of my presentation? We're not seeing it yet. Here it goes. Yep. Great. Took it a little second, but we're there. All right. Thank you so much. So I'm going to kick it off. I just want to thank the um, National Academies and this board for having me today to have this um, great discussion as we speak on the theme of transition. 
I'm um, actually really glad to have this opportunity to talk to you about a more of an emerging issue in the energy water arena, which is the growing interest in looking at oil and gas wastewater or produced water for its reuse potential. Um, so for many years now, EDF has been collaborating with academics, industry, and other experts to better understand the science of produced water and its chemical character, treatment, and toxicity um, all of that towards being able to inform policy and regulatory decision making as this question evolves. And so please bear with me as I try to move through some of our most recent findings and data for your consideration at kind of a quick pace to stay on track today. Produced water, as I'm sure um, most of you all know, is a mixture of formation groundwater, chemical and fluids used in production, and anything that results from the mixture of these two things um, it returns to the surface with oil and gas, and in many like places, it returns in much larger volumes actually than the hydrocarbon itself. Uh, nationally, a little over a trillion gallons of produced water surface annually, and the predominant method for managing this waste stream both historically and today is through reinjection. Over 90% of produced water is managed this way. However, as regions grapple with the effects of climate change, drought, disposal challenges like seismicity, and other business and economic strains, many are beginning to look at this waste stream as um, for its potential as a resource. And so there are numerous, numerous recent publications and plans that identify this issue um, that you could look to for a broader discussion. Um, one of those is EPA's Water Reuse Action Plan, which includes produced water in one of the five major sources of water for potential reuse. The Groundwater Protection Council's report on produced water is arguably the best existing primer on the multiple facets of this issue. I'm somewhat biased, I should disclose. I was one of the authors and on the leadership group for this, but it really is a fantastic resource and includes multiple modules on things like research needs, technical considerations, regulatory considerations. And I just want to highlight that at the Permian Basin, which is kind of a hot spot for this issue, no pun intended necessarily, but New Mexico is in year two of a research consortium aimed at addressing some of these questions related to reuse. And Texas is moving towards likely passing a bill that will set up a similar stakeholder group. So what are we really talking about when we talk about produced water reuse in this context? So there are two main buckets. Utilizing produced water to supplement or replace freshwater use for oil field operations is a chief among these alternatives. And if it's conducted in a manner that really reduces spills and leaks, this is, this is a really good forward momentum opportunity. Um, it's a positive move away from putting pressure on local freshwater resources for development. Um, I'm actually not gonna spend my time talking with you about this uh, option for reuse today. What I wanna spend more time about are these alternatives to look at the release or reuse of treated produced waters outside of the oil and gas environment. Uh, these are um, come with much more complex considerations surrounding identifying and appropriately managing risk. A uh, chief among these challenges is a really a foundational limitation in our knowledge regarding the, the more comprehensive chemical and toxicological character of produced water, combined with a present lack of really updated regulatory programs that are designed to manage this wastewater in these new ways. And that's primarily due to a lack of a historical need for this kind of research around produced water because of the tradition of managing produced water through underground injection. Uh, so with the time I have today, I wanna give you a really high level overview of these issues and better and EDF's work to better elucidate the challenges ahead. So a key area of work for us has been focused on trying to tease out what we know and don't know about the chemicals in produced water itself. Um, because we've identified this as a, as a real challenge. So our health scientists worked with Texas A&M and the Endocrine Disruption Exchange to review the literature and identify studies on produced water, which, and we use that to develop a comprehensive database and a framework to prioritize those chemicals. That paper and the database are available in an open source, jour source journal that DOI is on your slide. So in this first review, we identified a little under 1,200 constituents in produced waters nationally. And so using this database, we were able to do things um, and across research across other forms of information. So for example, we were able to um, take our database and crosswalk it with uh, available toxicological data. 
and see what we have for these produced water constituents. And it turns out the answer is really very little. So less than 14% of the constituents in this database have the type of toxicity you, you would need to conduct really a good risk assessment. Um, and we were also able to look at how these chemicals were represented on other lists or databases like regulatory programs that might apply if you look to discharge or reuse. And I'm gonna talk about that more here in a moment. One key point I wanna make quickly about the database is a really a notable limitation in the data set. We are limited to, um, to gathering data only where produced waters have been tested and studied and only on what was actually looked for. So that common issue of you're only gonna find what you're looking for. Um, so regional variation is a really important example. On this slide, I have two graphics. Um, the one on the right represents the latest compiled uh, data in a report form on produced water volumes alone. And it's kind of an intensity map. So I've circled the area in the Southwest where is the Permian Basin where we see large volumes and where there's this growing interest in alternative forms of reuse. And on the contrast on the left is a distribution of our produced water studies that we compiled by state. And you can see that these two things over, don't overlap. So the states producing really high volumes of produced water and investigating its reuse are really drastically underrepresented in the published literature. So generally speaking, we don't have enough data about produced water. But a more important point is that decision makers, especially regulators, really need information about their region's specific produced water. And that's because produced water is highly variable. Um, you know, if you look at geography, geology, time, operator to operator, well to well, day to day, we can generalize, yes, but the regional data will be really key in making informed and protective decisions. And we don't necessarily have enough of it where we need it. So I want to turn now to share a little bit more specific data and talk about what these research challenges and knowledge gaps might mean in a regulatory context as we think about the potential for expanded reuse. So really quickly from a regulatory framework, um, simply put, the frameworks for produced water discharge and reuse are pretty limited. Um, they really weren't written with the idea of widespread discharge and reuse in mind and don't usually specifically address the constituents of concern we find in the literature and produce water. Um, because it represents the most comprehensive existing framework, I'm gonna focus on surface discharges in the Clean Water Act today. Um, but a huge asterisk here is that this framework that I'm talking about and this initial analysis that we've done is not for discharges outside of the Clean Water Act. So other scenarios that are considered like land application, irrigation, aquifer recharge, they really have little to no applicable standards or regulatory programs that are specifically equipped to consider and apply to reuse of produced waters and the constituents we're concerned about there. So I'll put that on as a, um, a, a major gap that's worth further research. But in the NPDES program under the Clean Water Act, the basic rule of thumb is that no discharge of produced water is allowed direct from an operating site with two key exceptions to know about. First, an operator can transport their produced water offsite to a POTW or a CWT. These are two types of treatment facilities. Um, treatment and discharge via a municipal facility or a POTW is allowed for only for conventional oil and gas production and usually occurs in really limited areas, predominantly in the Marcellus region in the Northeast. Treatment and discharge via CWT or more centralized industrial treatment facility happens at a handful of facilities, again, predominantly in the Northeast, um, but that has been recently studied by EPA who identified a number of concerns about the applicability of the program to produce water. And finally, there's an important consideration to the no discharge rule where if you're west of the 98th meridian, Discharges from well sites are allowed if they're of good enough quality for wildlife, livestock, ag, and are put to those use, uses. So the question really becomes here, how do we define good enough quality or define what the appropriate regulatory program for reuse really looks like? And permit writers are left to answer these questions and doing so is, com is complex. So when we're looking to establish a regulatory or permitting program, there are a number of basic questions that we were thinking about when we started to think about how we could use our database to help. What constituents are we concerned about? Are there approved analytical methods, meaning methods that can detect and quantify a constituent and be used in a regulatory environment that's legally enforceable? 
Are there existing standards we might be able to look at? Do we have the toxicity information we need to understand what, who, and at what levels these pollutants might come into contact with and might they cause harm? Um, so EDF has recently updated our database and used the tool to start breaking down some of these challenges. And so this presents at a really high level some of our findings. So basically our new database has a little over 1,350 produced water constituents. So if you look at the EPA approved analytical methods, the kind of methods you'd need in a regulatory environment, we have a detection challenge. Um, not only are there limitations in what's disclosed as being put down whole, but we're also dealing with a large number of chemicals that really haven't otherwise been incorporated into programs and needed a method. So less than 25% of these constituents have approved analytical methods. So if we want to look at what we have available today in the world of standards, we want to we want to first and foremost look, okay, where can we assess a constituent and know that we have a standard if we wanted to incorporate it into a regulatory program. So right off the bat, we lose about coverage for about a thousand potential constituents because we don't have the analytical methods today. Um, for those that are left, are there opportunities? Am I at my time, Brenda? You can go for another, another minute or so. Great, okay. So of those, there are about a, a little over 100 that are already covered in the Clean Water Act. Um, and of those, there are um, about 167 that actually do have comprehensive toxicity data. And so what, I, what I'm moving through here is there are some opportunities to look at standards that we have today um, that are covered by, the constituents are covered. So really quickly, I'm just gonna put this slide up and I'll move through it so I can. If the interest in looking to produce water as a resource really holds, it's vital that necessary research and regulatory development is done to ensure that we can write the appropriate protective permits that don't inadvertently allow for beneficial reuse harming our existing freshwater ecosystems, wildlife, properly and public health. So more research is really key. And there are some low hanging fruit opportunities, like I mentioned, where there are standards on the books that we might be able to use if we incorporate them into a permitting program. Um, and we might need to look at where we have toxicity data and could use that to develop new standards or inform more appropriate research. And all of this is really to ensure that we're asking the right decisions as society, as regulators, as researchers, how are we judging the viability of this practice of produced water use? So, you know, you'll often see a question like, um, see a, position that produced water can be treated to meet drinking water standards, but that really only covers about 50 produced water constituents and may not be really the constituents we're most worried about. Or it might say this meets the oil and gas effluent limitation guideline, but that has only one standard for oil and grease. So the end of the um, answer is really, how are we defining good enough quality and are we asking the right questions about produced water to look at this opportunity for reuse? We really want to design these fit for purpose programs that we know um, are based on an understanding of produced water, knowing what the requirements for your end use are based on those constituents that are concerned in produced water, and design a program that meets those targets. And there's just a lot of research that we need to do if we want to get there. Um, so I will wrap up there. Great. Thank you, Nicole really interesting to think about produced water reuse and, and where we need to go with, with research and priorities there. I um, want to invite any board members with, with questions. We, we just have a couple of minutes for, for questions here to, to please raise your hand. Um, and, and while you're thinking of those, just to get us going, you know, if you had to choose a sort of single direction for what you see as the highest research priority from sort of the earth science community to help advance where we need to go um, in kind of this legal framework to, to better utilize these, these produced waters, where would you say that that priority is from the science community? For the science community, I would say one of the biggest gaps right now is that land application component that I really couldn't get to. So, so really diving into what the hazards are, what the exposure pathways are, um, how might we take what we know and don't know about produced water and think about the proper criteria or guidelines in a land application context. A good example, in the Clean Water Act context, we have the whole effluent toxicity test or the wet test that can look at 
high throughput, comprehensive, like the complex mixture and identify at least that there's a toxicity red flag. We don't have a fantastic equivalent for that in the land application context. So um, there are some challenges in knowing um, what are the standards? What are we concerned about in produced water if we think about crop uptake, soil impacts, runoff, uh, wildlife or livestock consumption? Those are some questions that I think often fall through the cracks because we do focus on the Clean Water Act side. It's important if we're going to actually think about um, using this water in the land arena. Great, thank you so much, Nicole. All right, in the interest of staying on schedule, we're going to move on. Um, panelists, uh, board members, and, and audience members, as you have questions, you know, do, do keep them uh, in mind as we'll come back to a full panel discussion after we hear from our, our three speakers. So we'll, we'll move on here. So next we will hear from Rebecca Hernandez. Rebecca is an assistant professor of earth system science and ecology in the Department of Land, Air and Water Resources and co-director of the Wild Energy Initiative at the University of California, Davis. She directs field-based, data-intensive, and technology-supported research at the intersection of energy development and the environment. Her work on energy ecology has been featured in the Washington Post, National Geographic, NPR, Forbes, and Scientific American. Rebecca, we're excited to have you here with us today and look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. I'm just setting up my slide deck. There we go. Can you all see that? Yes, looks good. Oops. Oh, oh no. We lost it. Oh no. <laughs> okay, one more time. Let's see. There we go. Okay, you can see that. Yes. All right. Well, um, thank you so much to the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources um, for organizing this event um, and for your leadership on this topic. I'm just really pleased to be here with you all. Um, one question that I really enjoy asking my students at UC Davis is how much land have you used today? And often I'm met with confused faces and a few hesitantly raised hands. And I typically follow this up by saying, uh, how many of you have turned on a light, a laptop, or an iPhone? So many of us here today might know that turning on a light, a laptop, or any appliance that uses uh, fuel or electricity, that uses land. And in fact, um, all energy supporting human activities requires land, both directly and indirectly. But how much and to what end? Many of us here um, know that this is something to be true. So even in geographically large countries, this reality can and is becoming a problem of great ferment. So for example, in the United States, energy development is now the largest driver of land use and land cover change. And here in the US, an area larger than the size of Texas, about 800,000 kilometers squared, is expected to be impacted by energy development and infrastructure by 2040. So the need to account for land and ecosystem impacts for energy becomes more probative amidst a global call by scientists like myself and conservation groups that we need to save half of Earth's ecosystems for nature and where loss of croplands and pasture <clears throat> under such scenarios are really substantial. So how will we fit everything in? Now, in the beginning, humans used wood for energy, right, from the biosphere. These pre-industrial or organic economies, they relied on biomass that drove deforestation and required large areas of tree plantations to support really small local energy demands for populations that were much smaller than today. Now, the 20th century uh, was noteworthy um, for three transformations. 
all generating novel ecological impacts of energy on, the, on planet Earth. First, in the rise of total energy consumption, which is an order of magnitude greater than pre-industrial times. Secondly, in the use of hydrocarbons, coal, oil, and natural gas for elect electricity. But last, and, and certainly not least, in a greater separation across landscapes from where energy was being generated to where it was being consumed. No longer were we restricted to the distance we could walk to carry firewood. Instead, we could site energy infrastructure away from our view sheds, often into marginalized minority, as well as indigenous communities. And we could transport that energy as electricity along extensive transmission lines. And this is what I've defined as what's called outsiding. Uh, and you can read about that in a study on local energy um, in front of sustainability. But for the first time, impacts of energy on land, they really manifested in these direct, indirect, and latent modes along these very ex expansive and intractable supply chains. So in my group, a motivating question for our research is, how will we meet our rapid renewable energy goals while maintaining our need for conservation and food production. And although we study diverse energy technologies, we often use solar energy as a model energy type to study these relationships because it dwarfs the potential of other renewable energy technologies, including wind and biomass by several orders of magnitude. And it's so modular and cosmopolitan in its accessibility. Uh, IRENA's remap case shows that PV may grow over the next 10 years, reaching a cumulative capacity of approximately 3,000 gigawatts by uh, 2030 and almost 9,000 gigawatts by 2050. So this is uh, 18 times higher than installed capacity in, in 2018. So in 2015, we developed the Carnegie Energy Environmental Compatibility Model. This is a satellite-based uh, decision support tool, and we use this tool to evaluate how well we are siting ground-mounted utility-scale solar energy, specifically installations greater than 20 megawatts. So these are super big installations. And we focused on the state of California in the United States, which has really been at the vanguard of global development for several decades. Now, the map on the left that you can see here, this shows all solar energy installations colored uh, according to their sustainability index and sized by capacity. And we used a three-tiered ranking for power plant sites. So compatible, potentially compatible, and incompatible. Now, if you look at the pie charts, uh, you can see that we found that less than 15% of PV and CSP installations were sited in compatible areas, and many were sited in incompatible areas, owing in large part to extended distances to existing transmission, and some were marked as incompatible because they were sited in areas uh, of endangered and threatened species habitat. So we also explored the siting of these installations by land cover type, and we found that PV power plants are found in 10 land cover types, but the plurality were sited in natural environments. So these are shrublands and scrublands, and this is notable because these ecosystems represent here in California, in part, the California Floristic Biodiversity Hotspot. This is a global biodiversity hotspot. Now, there exists only a limited number of studies that have assessed the impact of energy on land across all major electricity sources. And to date, all of them have had some methodological limitations or weaknesses. So here, in work led by Dr. Jessica Levering, we calculated the land use intensity of energy for real world sites across all major sources of electricity integrating data from published literature, databases, and original uh, digitizing and data calculation. 
And this is what we found. We found that ground mounted uh, solar energy, uh, including both concentrating solar power and photovoltaics, this is an order of magnitude uh, lower than, than hydro and dedicated biomass, um, but requires more land than coal, natural gas, residue biomass, wind, geothermal, and nuclear. nuclear. But in terms of land use and land cover change, solar energy integrated into pre-existing infrastructure, this is our one free pass or free lunch as we could call it. This incurs zero additional land use and land cover change impacts. And our work in our lab is currently focusing on calculating opportunities within the commercial building stocks to serve as recipient environments uh, for solar energy, um, especially large commercial buildings. So our preliminary results um, have revealed that the 30 largest commercial buildings in the US embody rooftop uh, footprints that average about 275,000 kilometers, uh, sorry, 275,000 uh, meters squared. And this is an area that uh, is equivalent to approximately 50 American football fields. These are very large buildings. Now, one more thing, this is that same data on a log scale. And I wanna point out um, to put dedicated biomass into context, powering an average US city of about 100,000 individuals for one year uh, would require about 78,000 hectares with dedicated biomass. So this is about 145,000 football fields, which might make us all feel a little bit uncomfortable. You might, you might remember from Brian's slide that that large green bioenergy wedge um, for achieving cumulative uh, CO2 savings. And indeed, most global decarbonization pathways um, now emphasize dedicated biomass, um, some for which biomass is greater than all other sources combined. But using these data, we can then consider both the environmental impacts from direct emissions um, and from land together. And this really confers a more comprehensive comparison of total environmental impacts. So that area encircled in red here on your slide um, this is really the sweet spot, geothermal, nuclear, solar, and wind, in that these sources of energy are optimized in terms of their CO2 emissions and impacts on land. But we need to consider other impacts too, right? Um, especially those impacting biodiversity and ecosystem services, even cultural services. In California, my work shows that deserts are prioritized right, as recipient environments for solar energy development. But deserts globally embody these longstanding ecological, economic, and cultural resources for humans, and especially to uh, indigenous land rights holders. Here, my, my colleague, Dr. Steven Grodsky and I, we measured the effect of solar energy development um, decisions on, on desert plants at one of the world's largest concentrating solar power plants in Ivanpah, California. And we found negative effects of solar energy um, on this desert scrub plant community. Specifically, we found that perennial plant cover and structure were lower in the bladed treatments, which is often what happens with these power plants than in the mode treatments. And we determined that cacti species and, and Mojave yucca are particularly vulnerable uh, to solar energy development that is blading and mowing. Whereas schismus, which is an invasive annual grass um, that often promotes desert fires, um, is facilitated by blading. We're also interested uh, in elucidating impacts of solar energy development decisions in this system on ecosystem services. So here we found the desert uh, scrub plant community confers 188 instances of ecosystem services, including uh, carbon sequestration and pollination and cultural services like sense of place and indigenous tools to 18 Native American ethnic groups. And we found that bladed and mowing treatments uh, reduced cultural provisioning and regulating ecosystem services of desert plants compared to the undeveloped control. So overall, the study demonstrates the potential for ground-mounted solar energy development in deserts to reduce biodiversity 
and socio-ecological services um, and emphasizes or resources, sorry, but it also emphasizes the, the value of integrating renewable energy infrastructure uh, locally and into the built environment. Now, moving forward, my colleagues and I have proposed a new model and one that builds upon the excellent work of Dr. Bakshi at Ohio State University for engineering solar energy systems and renewable energy systems broadly um, in a way that maximizes both technological and ecological benefits. So we identified over uh, 15 different types of these installations that can be developed known as techno-ecological synergies of solar uh, solar energy, and this includes installations over land, over water, um, and importantly in cities, um, even within agricultural areas. And all of these produce about, uh, we found 20 unique uh, beneficial techno-ecological outcomes from these this type of engineering and design. So examples include the utilization of contaminated land for solar energy generation. Um, that can include land related to um, areas uh, formerly mined for coal, for example, um, agrivoltaics, range voltaics, photovoltaics, solar energy coupled with uh, ecosystem restoration and pollinator habitat. Rob Davis um, with Fresh Energy is really making huge gains on that uh, opportunity in the US. And our attention in our lab has really turned to these novel applications and quantifying the net technological and ecological outcomes of, of these um, opportunities. Um, for example, we're conducting a four-site synchronized study um, of floating solar energy. Um, we're studying relationships between floating solar and PV performance, biodiversity, and hydrology, um, including water impacts. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators and my, my graduate students and my funders, without which uh, none of this would be realized. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Really fascinating to think about all these connections around land use and ecological change as we imagine this transition towards ramping up renewables. So appreciate that. And um, we'll invite folks to note their questions so that we can come back to them for our, for our full panel discussion after we hear our next and final speaker. So with that, I will go ahead and introduce our, our last speaker of the panel, um, Benjamin Holton. Ben is the Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Science and a Cornell University professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and of Global Development. Ben is the founding co-chair of the California Collaborative for Climate Change Solutions, which works with researchers from key research institutions to accelerate the translation of research findings into practical climate solutions. He also directs over 100 acres of farmland carbon sequestration projects to improve crop yields and create new financial markets for farmers and researchers. Unfortunately, Ben uh, had an emergency today and is not able to be with us in person. However, he recorded his talk, which we will play now. Um, Garrett, Boudinot, one of his team members, uh, is joined us here today and will join for the panel discussion after our break following Ben's presentation. So we will now show his recorded talk. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present to you today. I am Ben Holton, the Ronald P. Lynch Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and a professor of global development and Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Cornell University. Apologies that I can't be there in person. Uh, luckily, my research associate, Dr. Garrett Bonneau, will be available for the q and I'm going to briefly overview this idea of enhanced weathering, the notion of grinding up rock, applying it to the soil, and having that rock break down so that it creates carbonates that securely lock carbon, extracting it from the atmosphere into a form that no longer causes dangerous climate interference. There is a lot of discussion today about enhanced weathering as a possible billion ton level solution, but that capacity and the gap to the science and deployment is very significant. And so what I wanna to talk to today is first, the idea of enhanced weathering as a solution 
to atmospheric CO2 accumulation, including the global capacity for uh, this pathway to operate in agriculture. I will then discuss results from the Working Land Innovation Center that I direct with my colleague, Dr. Wendy Silver at UC Berkeley, where we are deploying this technology across more than 100 acres of farmland in California, and that includes diverse cropping systems and rangelands. I will present some preliminary results from the first year of our study in the Working Lands Innovation Center, and then we'll talk briefly about issues and opportunities. So taking the big picture perspective, we all know about Earth's Goldilocks and the fact that our planet maintains life because of, first, its distance from the sun being just right. But on top of the Earth's Goldilocks and the fact that uh, we have this orientation to the sun, there are incredible feedbacks between atmospheric two and climate that result in stabilization uh, over time so that the Earth doesn't end up in a runaway greenhouse effect like Venus or get too cold like Mars and rather stays just right. The secret ingredient involves silicate rock weathering reactions, which consume atmospheric CO2, creating bicarbonates in dissolved form that eventually make their way and wash from the land into the ocean, forming calcium carbonate that can securely lock a mole of carbon dioxide from this initial reaction uh, for millions and millions of years. This set of reactions known as the Ure reactions are faster when uplift exposes fresh rock and the temperature rises. So in other words, it gets hotter and CO2 rises, weathering happens more quickly, thereby acting as negative feedback on runaway climate change. It also is slower when there is less fresh rock exposed to Earth's surface and as temperature decreases. This allows for natural processes of CO2 ventilation from volcanoes to accumulate CO2 at a level that continues to allow for Earth's temperature to experience a relatively stable condition. So the question of today is, can this kind of approach this technology that the planet has invented and been operating for billions of years, the accelerator, well, of course, there is potential for accelerating this process. One of the ideas is to take finely uh, crushed rocks that are a byproduct of the mining industry and apply them to cropland soils to greatly accelerate what is normally a relatively slow process over time. Current models suggest that anywhere within reason, uh, enhanced weathering, if applied this way, could get you to two to five billion tons of CO2 removal on Earth's croplands. But again, the gap between that capacity and deployment is extremely significant. So just to go through in a cartoon formula, what we're talking about here, we take crushed rock, uh, that is enriched in calcium and magnesium silicates. We apply it to the soil where there is CO2 that is being pumped up in the soil environment through respiration um, from microbes and roots. The water from irrigation or precipitation comes in contact with that CO2 and it can form carbonic acid, which dissolves the calcium silicate. And that initially forms bicarbonate calcium ions and some silica. So we get two moles of CO2 sequestered for this initial reaction sequence. However, if some of the calcium carbonate precipitates back out in the soil, you release one CO2 back to the air, meaning only one mole is sequestered. So in either, in either uh, scenario, whether we form bicarbonate or carbonate, carbon dioxide is removed and carbonates in the soil have a lifespan of over 77,000 years on average. Of course, that is highly contingent on land use change, but it suggests a very long-term uh, carbon sink. In the ocean environment, you're talking about a transport time that can get you millions of years of CO2 removal. So very secure carbon that is not susceptible to biological reactions in the way that organic carbon might be. 
In the Working Lands Innovation Center, we are trying to fill the gap between where the capacity is and where the science needs to go to really understand how this technology operates across diverse cropping systems, when carbon dioxide is removed, uh, when it is not so efficiently removed, and how we can work with farmers, ranchers, and industry partners, government, and tribes to understand the full potential uh, in terms of barriers to adoption. In the Working Lands Innovation Center, we have created an ensemble of different researchers across California, working in combination with the US Department of Agriculture and local government agencies, as well as private farmers and UC Extension to examine in, uh, an array of approaches dealing with enhanced weathering. In this approach, we are also examining enhanced weathering in combination with organic amendments from compost, in this case, working with manure repurposing and green waste, as well as biochar, which is being uh, generated from salvaged trees that impose a fire risk. Applying these separately in combination along the backbone of the Central Valley, all the way into the Imperial Valley along the border of Mexico gives us a bioclimactic envelope that allows us to really understand exactly how this technology works across a range of conditions that includes coastal conditions, which are relatively cool, and interior conditions, which are incredibly hot. We are working across corn, alfalfa, tomato, and orchards, as well as managed grazing lands and both in some of our research sites. We are measuring co-benefits in this project. We believe that one of the greatest opportunities for carbon dioxide removal will come when we have what we call carbon capture with benefits. That is enhanced yield in our cropping systems, more nutritious food supply and healthier soils, as well as things like water holding capacity. So we are measuring all these co-benefits in combination with greenhouse gas emissions, including flux towers and measurements uh, and techniques to understand enhanced weathering uh, within the soil. So we have observed some incredibly exciting results in only the first year of this study. This is, these are results from my uh, PhD student at UC Davis, uh, Iris Holzer. Iris has been examining enhanced weathering and the byproducts of the weathering reactions in lysimeters that are collecting soil water across control, metabasalt, and olivine plus metabasalt treatments. And she's finding an approximate doubling of CO2 sequestration in the form of bicarbonate in the soil water. In addition to the surface soils where she is examining uh, lysimeter water in the top six inches, she's also looking below the till environment and is starting to detect a little bit of evidence that bicarbonate is also forming uh, deeper into the soil just beneath where the weathered rock material is, is happening uh, in the surface. So really exciting results. We're not sure how well these results will hold, but I would add that these results are actually happening in a historic uh, drought in California, telling us that even under incredibly uh, extreme climates of the future, enhanced weathering still has the capacity to more than double CO2 removal, again, in the form of bicarbonate, which is not vulnerable to things like microbial decay. Scaled up, this would be approximately one ton of CO2 removal per acre, which is the equivalent with what you might find in an acre of trees planted to remove carbon dioxide. The notable except, exception here is that this is bicarbonate or inorganic carbon as opposed to organic carbon. In addition, we are finding evidence in the first year of trials for enhanced yield in alfalfa. We are still going through data in corn and other crops, but our alfalfa yields have gone up around 18% across 17 acres. And this is on real farms, uh, working with farmers throughout the Central Valley. We need to know if these results will hold. One year of results is not enough to draw any kind of conclusions, but it is compelling to see that yield is enhanced with rock dust. This is consistent with what has been found in relatively small settings in greenhouse environments in the past and is likely a product of some of the micronutrients that are released from the rock minerals as well as pH changes 
and perhaps even some water holding capacity changes, which we are exploring. There are many issues and opportunities in front of us still to understand how enhanced weathering can scale. There is still a heck of a lot of science that needs to take place in terms of understanding predictive analytics of the rate of weathering reactions and the fate of CO2. We are also exploring the life cycle of the material, including mining, uh, including uh, transportation and application, and how that can chew into some of the greenhouse gas benefits. And we are performing some optimization analysis in terms of economics and greenhouse gases in the project. But this is a huge area uh, that needs a lot more attention. Also, there are questions about the amount of rock dust that is available. And there's compelling evidence that there is enough rock dust uh, that has already accumulated over time to get us to billions of tons of CO2 removal on the planet if deployed on Earth's croplands and a future where slag uh, and uh, concrete uh, manufacturing byproducts as well as demolition could be used for enhanced weathering to avoid the need for mining operations. But there are still incredible barriers to adoption, and some of those are price point barriers that our farmers are facing. Uh, currently, we estimate that it's anywhere between $60 to $200 per ton of CO2 removed, so still need to get that price point down to something that's more on the order of $100 per ton of CO2. Also, science to application is a huge part of our project, and I won't get into that now. Perhaps in the Q&A, this can be discussed. But our theory of change means including suppliers, government, distribution, farmers, science and outreach together in our ecosystem model, our model of change to really understand the barriers to adoption and how to overcome them as quickly as possible. So our project is by design, one where co-creation involves uh, the application of the amendments in our understanding of where the science needs to meet the real world in terms of uh, what farmers are experiencing and how to bring the price points down. So thank you so much for this brief overview. Um, I look forward to the outcome of the question and answer uh, period, and I hope you have a terrific panel discussion. All right, thank you, Ben, for that great presentation and for recording it for us today. Um, we'll miss having him on the, on the panel, but look forward to a, a conversation with everybody after a quick break. Just want to thank Nicole and Rebecca and Ben for their excellent presentations and for being here with us today. Um, we will take a, a not quite a 15 minute break now and come back at five past the hour for our panel discussion. So please rejoin us at 2.05 Eastern time and please come with your, with your questions for all of our panelists and we'll look forward to a great discussion. Thank you. Hello, welcome back everybody. We hope you were able to join us for our presentations earlier today by Nicole Saunders, Rebecca Hernandez and Ben Holton. Nicole and Rebecca will now come back for a panel discussion and will be joined by Garrett Boudinot, a research associate with Cornell's Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, who works on the Enhanced Weathering Project with Ben Garrett. Um, and also works as uh, with Ben Garrett also works as a community science fellow with AGU's Thriving Earth Exchange and serves as a science advisor at Climate Music. Garrett, thank you for jumping in to join our panel. I appreciate your participation today. So for those of you joining us in the audience, please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A box and at the bottom of the screen. And we will intersperse those questions with questions from our Beezer board members. And so to start off, um, I'm you know, really excited to be able to have this discussion today at this intersection of, of water, land, 
um, subsurface rock processes and, and think about how we're sort of communicating across these different disciplines as we work towards this energy transition. And so I'm interested in, in hearing from our, our speakers today about what you see that's working in creating the space for these really sort of interdisciplinary conversations where we're talking about things in rock subsurface weathering to land and environmental justice to, to water and where you see sort of the strengths in, in creating the opportunities for these, these sort of cross-sector interdisciplinary um, conversations and, and where we're doing, where those conversations are, are happening. Um, and I guess, Rebecca, maybe can we, can I direct that one to you? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that that, you know, basically what you're asking is where you know, where is this going to be developed most effectively? And I think that that is at the um, really where where lots of different groups come together. Um, the, the one thing I've noticed in my research is that um, it takes an entire knowledge system um, to really shed light on all of the outcomes of a particular technology, both the the positive ones and the negative ones. And so, um, you know, making sure when you are working on a technology that you're incorporating the voices, um, the data from all of the groups involved, spanning uh, multiple sectors, you know, not non-governmental groups, government, uh, industry, academia. I feel like that's really, um, that's really where a lot of innovation can happen, um, especially when thinking about how to um, produce beneficial outcomes that outweigh the negative outcomes. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Um, Nicole or Garrett, would either of you like to answer this question, or we can we can go on to one of the questions from our from our board. Yeah, I think. This is Nicole. I can chime in quickly and just I I liked the idea that you brought in of the inter interdisciplinary and approaches to some of these challenges. Uh, one thing with the produced water in the oil and gas context is that um, we're only just now starting to see um, experts and entities and policymakers that are not traditionally involved with oil and gas decision making and oil and gas research chiming in on this challenge of looking to produce water and what the risks and opportunities are for its reuse. So things, everyone from the impact of communities and end users outside of the oil and gas context to traditional um, water reuse experts that are bringing a different perspective and needed nuance and new thinking to this challenge and raising what questions need to be asked and answered to um, ensure that if that moves forward, it does so in a way that doesn't increase risk. Great, thank you, Nicole. Um, I would like to invite Elizabeth I to ask a question. Thanks a lot, Brenda. Hello, everyone. Uh, and my uh, compliments to all, all three panelists. Really great talks. I have a, a question, actually. Uh, I'd like to ask Nicole. Nicole, it's nice to see you again. Um, just uh, in, in connection with, um, you talked a bit about the fit for purpose aspect of the produced water. And there's a degree of, um, of societal acceptance for some of the different applications, right? And I know the chemistry and the exposure pathways and so forth of the, the different types of produced water are, are a big issue and still need a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, research in certain cases, uh, certain parts of the country. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the volume challenge because there's um, for any given purpose, uh, want to assure a consistent supply of the water and in a lot of places that that's been intermittent and particularly with this last year where the the industry has had some uh, swings, if you will. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the quantity issue um, and, and, and how it ties to the quality challenges there. That's a great question, Elizabeth. Hi, nice to see you as well. And uh, thank you for the question. I, there are some really great experts, I would first say, on the quantity specifics. I would point directly to maybe Bridget Scanlon at Bureau of Economic Geology. She's published a lot of really fantastic, interesting research on this front. 
But generally speaking, I think you raise an important point that is that when you look at the reuse of a potential resource, how reliable is it? Um, how consistent is it? Are we going to have seasonal complications when we look at it? Does it vary? And so all of those basic infrastructure um, issues are really are important when you think about produced water. And the volume um, is a challenge. You know, I think in some of Bridget's studies out of the BEG, she's found that even if you were to put a large volume of this produced water to a certain use in a certain region, it's really not going to quench the thirst maybe of those uses like in agricultural context. And so I think there is a challenge there in realistically thinking about from a volume perspective and the cost of treatment and the cost of basically getting everything from one place to another. We all know that moving water period is very cost intensive. So thinking about that fit for purpose issue of in this place at this time, is there an opportunity? And perhaps the best and highest use of that water is to use it in oil and gas operations, stop using fresh water and look for um, reliable disposal alternatives and allow the fresh water to be used in those regions for those other purposes. And there may be some instances where it's worth the treatment to think about, but it's gonna be not a national um, application. It's definitely gonna be heavily regional, if not very localized, I think, because of that volume challenge and transportation and getting it where you need it. Great, thank you so much, Nicole. And I'll invite Jim to ask a question, Jim Sluice. Oh, we can't hear you, Jim. How about now? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this is for Rebecca, and it's really in the what's well, a two-parter in looking at land use and different energy sources. The first is is more on whether you've looked at. I, I found it intriguing. I know that you're looking at very large-scale solar, but when you look, you mentioned the the free lunch being if you put it on an existing building. One of the things, and, and this is because of personal experience, you come in, go to put like residential solar, there's a, a disincentive of oversizing your solar because of the way the net metering works. And it would seem that if you could fix that, I don't know if you've analyzed any of that, but if you could fix that disincentive so you would maximize the solar on, on an individual roof, that that would have a collective benefit. Um, and um, anyway, so that's part one. The other is looking at at different. I, I in in your in one of your slides you showed land impact versus uh, CO two or or, or, eco, or ecological impact, and and so because the CO two impact things like natural gas go, went out quite a far on the right on that. But have you have you also looked at modeling what would what if you were doing some level of of CCUS with natural gas? Have you looked at where that would fall on the continuum? Since most most energy analysis is hey we're we're going to need some component of of at least of natural gas in the future. In fact, some models say we'd actually in the near term have to increase natural gas use to meet energy needs. Great question. Thank you, Jim. Uh, to your first uh, question on incentives, um, I have to say there are a couple other experts um, who are making um, a, a lot quicker, faster, better strides um, on that on that particular topic. Um, Greer Ryan at the um, Center for Biological Diversity put out a really good report uh, quantifying different incentives for um, low footprint uh, renewables, solar energy in the US. And I think that really it's it's clear that the, the incentives that we have in place um, are not matched to facilitate uh, low footprint, low carbon energy development in the U.S. And this is this is problematic when we think about um, the fact that land use and land cover change is um, something that facilitates greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it, it, it also reduces habitat for wildlife. So, you know, what I like to tell folks um, is that 
um, you know, one of the most impactful things you can do as an individual is to put solar on your rooftop or on your uh, commercial building, because not only are you uh, reducing emissions associated with just the um, lower uh, CO2 um, uh, emissions associated with that technology compared to fossil fuels, you're also um, reducing emissions associated with the land use and land cover change that would have otherwise occurred if that renewable energy infrastructure was developed in a, say, natural um, area. So, um, you know, this is this is complicated, and the um, the like I said, the the policies surrounding this um, understanding in the U.S. today are are not are not well suited to um, to engender an outcome for uh, a low footprint transition. And I think it's something that we really need to um, acknowledge and and um, make sure that we're um, understanding the 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 consequences of that um, down 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 the road. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm going to jump in with a couple of uh, questions from our attendees who had had several sort of detail specific questions for for Garrett about the enhanced rock weathering. Um, uh, experiments and so there were there are a number of them that I'll sort of go through here thinking about how does this change the local pH of the soil environment and does that then change the nutrients of the produced crops um, and could that perhaps be a benefit for some biospecies that are that are being being farmed and, and things like that so those are sort of the first set of questions around around how it changes the pH and, and perhaps there are there are crops that could benefit from some of these these enhanced weathering reactions. Yeah, thanks for for bringing those up, Brenda. I saw those questions uh, in the Q&A and was really excited to see those um, to have a chance to get in the weeds on how enhanced weathering works. And I think those questions are spot on and to pro provide a little bit more detail uh, of the chemistry behind enhanced weathering. It's actually based on a change in soil pH. Um, and so as those magnesium and calcium rich silicate rocks dissolve, they're releasing those positively charged magnesium or calcium ions. What that does is that shifts the charge balance of the soil pore waters, changes the way that hydrogen speciates, and ultimately it increases the pH. So that one, one uh, question hit the nail on the head. It does increase the pH of the soil. Uh, and from an agronomic perspective, that's actually really advantageous. So a lot of the world's soils are actually over acidic. And when soils are very acidic, it means that nutrients are more likely to leach away from the soils and it, it, and it increases the bioavailability of toxic metals. And so any strategy that we can use to increase the pH of soils actually has a number of benefits for overall agronomy, including improved nutrient retention. And so there's a number of soils, uh, particularly in the tropical regions of the, of the planet where soil productivity is limited uh, because of the acidity. And so if we could deploy enhanced weathering in some of those areas, we would have incredible benefits for soil health and thus human health, human nutrition, as well as mitigating global climate change. Uh, and farmers already use one practice that's very similar to enhanced weathering to increase the pH and that's called liming. They add calcium carbonate to soils to uh, do that same thing, increase the pH. Unfortunately, when it's a calcium carbonate, that process releases CO2. So when we replace that with a calcium silicate, it reverses the, the direction of uh, carbon speciation and encourages that bicarbonate production uh, that draws down CO2. So that was a great question. Um, and, and hopefully, Brenda, did that answer the, the big one there? Yeah, there's a couple more details I'll follow up with here. There was a question about, well, has coal ash been tried as a potential um, source for that? And do does this perhaps uh, 
change calcification in the soil over time, you know, this, this change in pH and, and these changed reactions? Yeah, great questions. Um, it kind of gets the front end and the back end of enhanced weathering. So I, yeah, I saw the coal ash question. I also saw someone asked about potentially using mine tailings um, as a source and, and those are spot on. So actually a lot of the rock dust that we're already using and deploying in the field are byproducts of mining uh, that are already ground to a, a really good particle size for this process. And they have that ideal chemistry. And you know, thinking about how can we address resource priorities and mitigate climate change while also uh, reducing adverse environmental impacts, kind of the, the goal of this panel, that's, you know, in, enhanced weathering is at the intersection of all of those goals because the, the global mining industry produces an enormous amount of waste that we're finding has the ideal chemistry to be deployed, not only to minimize uh, environmental quality negative impacts, but actually have positive impacts on the global climate. So um, absolutely, there are other industrial waste products, uh, coal ash, cement kiln dust, things that also have calcium, magnesium, and an ideal chemistry for enhanced weathering. But what's important with a lot of these materials is that we not only think of what's the calcium and magnesium, those, those uh, positively charged ions that drive enhanced weathering, but also what's the uh, concentration of potentially harmful trace elements, trace metals. And so uh, in the literature, you'll see some uh, really high estimates of how much carbon dioxide enhanced weathering can bring down. And then you'll see the, the material they chose was something that also has high levels of chromium and nickel and things that we really wouldn't want in our global agricultural soils. Uh, and so this goes into, I mean, life cycle analysis has been used a number of times today. This definitely goes into that life cycle assessment of enhanced weathering, of what are the costs uh, in terms of the availability of materials and their potential negative impacts on soils, but then what are the benefits that we could have for the climate? And, and we know that there are plenty of materials available that don't have those negative uh, uh, impacts from chromium and nickel and, and other heavy metals, but can provide the ideal chemistry for uh, enhanced weathering. Just to put numbers on it, if that helps. Um, so some studies have, have suggested that globally we need somewhere around 10 to 30 billion tons of rock material for global enhanced weathering. There's over 40 billion tons of existing uh, mine uh, tailings just from metal and ore in the US alone. So the US has tons of material just sitting around waiting to be used for a process like this. And again, it could have a lot of benefits. Um, briefly, I'll mention the calcification because um, that, th that can be confusing. Ben talked about bicarbonate, then going to carbonate. Uh, what we're finding is that in a lot of soils, the majority of carbon uh, or the, the majority of the fate of carbon from enhanced weathering is actually bicarbonate. And the overall fate of that is to the oceans, where in the oceans, it might either buffer ocean acidification, another really important climate benefit of enhanced weathering, or precipitate eventually into calcium carbonate. Uh, so certainly it can happen in soils and it depends on the soil uh, physical structure, soil pH and climate, um, but we're not seeing negative uh, impacts from soil calcification. And again, primarily we're seeing uh, bicarbonate uh, even having further positive climate impacts in the ocean. Thank you. Amelia, let's go to your question. Okay, um, thanks. So, so my question is for Nicole. And Nicole, I'm based in New Mexico. So of course, produced water is something I think about a lot. And um, I really enjoyed your talk. And one of the things that kind of caught my attention that I hadn't really thought about before is when you mentioned the geochemical variability in composition of produced water regionally across the United States. And it made me realize that I probably need to start thinking about in New Mexico, whether Permian Basin produced water is geochemically different than San Juan Basin. So I'm curious um, just to delve into that a little bit more. And the, the questions I had are, I'm assuming that depending on the, you know, the unit that the produced water is coming from, even within 
one region, you may get variability in produced water. And I'm curious about how the regional variability across the US say would vary compared to the geochemical variation in produced water within say New Mexico. And then also it's kind of a big question. If you could just point me in the direction of a place where I could um, discover some of that for myself, that would be great. Great question. Um, so the first thing is that I one of the scientists on staff that actually was the author of one of our publications, her name is Dr. Chloe Danforth. We have partnered with a couple of different researchers and there is um, there is there's probably some research that's really interesting to you that would have been done on DJ Basin water in Colorado but their findings could raise some questions that may be something that you'd want to look at on New Mexico waters generally. Um, and I will get you those paper citations. If you wanna shoot me an email, I'm happy to actually send you the links to those rather than name them off the top of my head on a panel today, I'm not that good. Um, and then the second question, I think you're, it's really spot on. And you know, it's hard to say we haven't done a comprehensive comparison, there are definitely some generalizations you can make, for example, about the total dissolved solids that you might see from region to region. But I think that you will see even within New Mexico, the San Juan versus the Permian, and even within the Permian, the Delaware versus the Midland subbasins having very different um, produced waters that will impact what we're targeting from a treatment system and what we're looking for in our regulatory system. And that's really challenging because there's just not a lot of comprehensive, you know, using research, advanced research methods more than just GCMS, more advanced um, non-targeted analysis to characterize those waters. There's not a ton of that done on New Mexico water. Same goes in, um, in Texas, where we're also thinking about these questions where I am. Um, so, so you do want to look region to region. And then we've also, there are also some really interesting studies that look over the lifespan of a well alone. So even if you take the geographical or geological considerations out of the picture and look at time alone from day one where you've completed a well, obviously you're getting flow back and more fluids that you're using and chemicals you're using in that initial fracturing operation. But beyond that, when you look 30, 60, 300, 900 days, you do see some very interesting and um, impactful variation. So when we talk about reusing produced water in any given context, you know, there's a lot of generalization about that term, but we really need to understand what specifically are we talking? Are we talking about day 30 produced water? Are we talking about day 600? Maybe the TDS changes, maybe trace organics change in a really important way. Maybe a certain well has been um, up, you know, they, they might have done maintenance on a well, they might have done some kind of operation on a well, the what was utilized in that process, there um, could come back and show up in that produced water. And if, if there's not a lot of conversation at the front end that we're expecting that or we're knowing we're going to see it, we may not be prepared for that in the treatment receiver. So there's a lot of different things to consider back when it comes to the variability component when, when you think about developing reuse programs. And please don't forget to email me. I'm happy to make sure I get you whatever papers I know about. Great, thanks a lot. I really appreciate your comments. Sure. Great, thank you, Nelia and Nicole. Um, here's a, another question from our from our participants for, for Garrett um, about sort of the siting. So mine sites are often not around agricultural fields. So what are the transportation limits to truck the crushed rock to the agricultural land? Um, does it have to be sort of large scale enough to see those significant impacts of, of carbon sequestration? And how does transportation link into that? Great question. Um, there are a surprising a large number of existing mine operations that do have a lot of the ideal chemistry for enhanced weathering across the country and across the globe. Um, and so we're not thinking about having to ship things across the country to reach um, the, the ideal farm candidates. Although certainly shipping is something uh, that needs to be done and needs to be optimized and commercially viable. Um, and, and, 
you know, when, when you mentioned the scale of the, the farm or the size of the farm, if that matters, one of the things we're really excited about with enhanced, res, uh, enhanced weathering is its ability to scale to all farm sizes. So this isn't something that only large farm operations would be able to take advantage of. Um, if you've got the equipment to apply fertilizer uh, or lime to your to your croplands, you can take advantage of enhanced weathering, get those agronomic and carbon benefits. Uh, but Ben alluded to this whole process a little bit uh, when he mentioned the costs as something that needs to be optimized and is currently a barrier. And so for a lot, of, and it gets to this question, that certainly the costs of transporting the materials, of acquiring and transporting the materials, do need to be offset by the cost of the carbon credits that the farmers might get. So we're really excited about enhanced weathering and other carbon sequestration and cropland options as a way to increase the economic viability of America's agricultural sector, but the economic benefits from carbon sequestration need to match the necessary inputs uh, that farmers need, both on the acquiring materials and the management and verification side of things. Um, and so there, there are certainly ways that we can get farms of all sizes, wherever they are, the material. And the question is, uh, does the, the, do the costs uh, match the benefits or do the benefits outweigh the costs? And I think there's also some creative, uh, Brian was talking about this, you know, market and policy uh, changes that need to happen. Um, I know that uh, cooperatives are things that farmers use currently, just small farm operations use to stay economically viable with these large uh, farm operations. Uh, and we're envisioning how farmers could have uh, carbon cooperations so that they could cost share some of the, the needed inputs or acquire enough of these materials that need to be shipped to get elsewhere. And, and the last thing I'll say is, I've been talking a lot about economic costs. There are, of course, carbon costs with transporting. Um, and so wherever the, these materials come from and go to, we need to make sure that the emissions from that transportation are lower than the carbon that we're sequestering. Some existing mo models suggest that uh, for many regions, we could easily get to a place where we're uh, emitting 10 to 30% of the carbon we're sequestering. So we're still sequestering a large, you know, the cost benefit still says this is a huge carbon benefit. Uh, and we're in the early stages of developing enhanced weathering. And so I'm optimistic that as, again, we look at those new, those, those other industrial materials and ways to safely use those, uh, optimize, uh, the ways that farmers can form cooperatives and share and, and stock pile a lot of these materials so that they could use rail instead of roads, for example. These are all creative ways that the market can move so that we can address this issue of getting the materials to the farmers safely and effectively. Great, thank you. Uh, Michael, I'll invite you to ask a question. Thank you to all the presenters. I have so many great questions, uh, so many questions based on your presentations, but maybe to start with Garrett, is there a limit to how much rock you can put on a unit of land before you accumulate too much um, other byproduct, for example, clay or silica? Great question. Um, the studies at the field scale are rather limited. So the Working Lands Innovation Center is really currently the largest field deployed trial system uh, in the world. And we're, we're still in our early phases. But some existing trials uh, in the mesocosm or kind of pot scale can uh, shine some light on this. We're seeing that uh, there is an upper limit to how much uh, rock material can be applied to soils before the soil becomes so basic or the pH increase is so high that you're no longer effectively dissolving the material. It turns out though that the amount of rock dust that uh, would be needed to, to generate that high of pH is pretty exorbitant. Um, it's upwards of 50 tons per acre, that's really high. What we apply is generally about 20 tons per acre, but we're gonna be trying with up to 40 tons per acre. So all of this is to say 
that is an open question. And when Ben says there's still a large gap between theory and deployment, that optimized amount of maximizing agronomic and carbon benefits with respect to the amount of uh, rock that we apply, that's at the forefront of the research we're doing. Brenda, can I ask a second question? Yeah, go ahead. I'm for Nicole. I was really struck when you showed the map of where produced waters are coming from, where waters are being produced, and where studies of what to do with that produced water have been undertaken. And it seemed like there was a great correlation between how dry a setting was and whether people had been exploring using produced waters. Is there a reason why California and Texas have not been exploring, have, have not take, undertaken as many studies about produced waters? Is there an expectation that uh, production will decrease over time? So no, I, you know, I think um, one point to make is that uh, the, we were looking at studies of produced water specifically that did advanced chemical characterization of produced water. So that's not to say that there haven't been different types of studies on produced water, maybe for oil field purposes or other places. Um, first and foremost is the first thing I think I wanna say in response to that. The other is that um, economics is a major driver in this, in this issue. So in Texas, for example, produced water is, um, predominantly probably more than 90%, it's hard to know the exact amounts right now, re-injected. Um, some of that is for just re-injection for disposal. Some of that is also technically a form of reuse through re-injection for enhanced oil recovery. So a large volume, I mean, nationally about 45%, I think was the last statistics I saw, of produced water is re-injected for enhanced oil recovery. So in that sense, it is reused in some places. Um, the other thing to know with Texas is that disposal wells are widely available and a low cost alternative for underground um, ejection and management of this waste stream. And from uh, the perspective of a scientifically based environmental group that worries a lot about public health and exposure risk, um, where those wells are constructed adequately at the moment, they do reduce exposure risk from the management of a really, really complex, often um, toxic waste stream. And so when we think about moving outside of the oil field, there's, there's both an economic consideration of the amount of treatment that you would need to do to treat this water to meet a standard that really has not yet to be really comprehensively set to address what we're concerned about in produced water. That number, just at a basic economic, um, needs, needs to be competitive with what your alternative is and then also your risk management decision. So in Texas, for example, I think we're just now starting to see that really ramp up. There's a consortium beginning to look at treatment of produced water for alternative options that we're gonna answer, ask some of these hard questions, but we haven't seen that yet, just basically from an economic standpoint. In California, I'm less familiar comprehensively with what they've done across the state. There, are, there is a small region of California where produced water from steam filled operations that are not hydraulically fractured in the Kern River Valley are used um, in the irrigation system for crops, including food crops in the uh, valley. There's a food safety panel that is doing an ongoing study of the safety of that practice in looking at comprehensive characterization of the water itself that's being used and anal analysis of the fruit and other issues and to look at public health impacts from consuming foods that are watered with produced water. So that's a very, very specific kind of a niche area where that's happening. It's not happening anywhere else in the country. Um, and that's due to a number of different factors, but there's a lot of interesting research on that with the food. If you think if you research the food safety panel and the California Coelho Irrigation Water District, those things would come up and you would see what's going on in California there. Great, thank you, Nicole. We'll go to a, a couple of questions for, for Rebecca next. Um, one uh, question from the, from the audience was about the, the impact for increased solar on heat island effects, urban heat island effects and, and what we see in that area. 
think you're still muted. You're not able to unmute. Eric, can you help Rebecca unmute? Oh no, a crash. <laughs> That's no good. Um, Amelia? Yeah, I had a question for Rebecca, but because she's crashed, I have a question for Garrett. Um, Garrett, I'm curious, a, a little uh, kind of a follow up on what Michael asked. Um, you know, you, you add rock dust to agricultural fields, and it. I think most you may not be able to answer this because it looked like the timescales that it, of the experiment so far were pretty short. But what I'm curious is, what is the time scale? You know, you add X amount of rock dust, 20 tons per acre. I can't remember what number you said, but and how, for how long does that geochemical reaction continue to completion? What's what's the time frame? Great question. Uh, and and yeah, unfortunately, because this is a relatively new technology and new idea, we're still figuring that out. Um, we're thinking this is an annual application, and so this is something that farmers can apply every year. That's what we're doing in our trials. Uh, and it depends on uh, the material or the, the long-term fate and efficacy each year of enhanced weathering depends on the material, um, the grain size. I saw there was a question in the Q&A of what's the ideal particle size uh, material. Uh, all of these things are very much still being optimized. Uh, and so, um, Ultimately, we want to increase the amount of dissolution that happens. So the more of these uh, particles that you fully dissolve, then the more each year it, it's eff effective. Uh, and that is a function of temperature, precipitation. And so we imagine that uh, the best mi mineral to, be, to use uh, for our trials in the Palma Valley in California are going to be in, in the rate and practice there it's going to be very different from the optimized practice that we have here in Ithaca, New York. Um, but that's a great question. It's something that we're still uh, optimizing, though we are relatively confident that uh, doing this each year for, for many years, uh, again, depending on the pH of the soil and the climate, that this can generate the same agronomic and climate benefits. Oh, good. I think we have Rebecca back. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I had to shut down my Zoom. It would not let me do anything. Um, yeah. Thank you. The um, the the well. I think I actually missed one of uh, Jim's question. He was asking about assessing the footprint um, combined of of um, CCS with natural gas. And um, to answer his question, no, our group has not done that analysis. Um, it would be really neat to see, um, to go from you know, production and capture um, and, and transportation to injection and, and quantify the, the land footprint of that. Um, my guess is that a lot of that perhaps would be um, um, comprised of footprint associated with with pipelines, um, as that's typically the case for you know the footprint of a natural gas power plant as a whole. Um, but our group would definitely be poised to answer that question. And um, certainly we're looking at other kind of gaps in the literature on footprint um, associated with energy infrastructure like uh, geothermal, um, energy storage. Those are um, two areas that need a lot more um, constraining in terms of the data that we have. Um, and then the other question was on oh uh, land surface temperatures um, or air temperatures and there is there's that's another really um, important gap I would say in the literature that needs to be closed um, there there um, there's consensus to date that um, that air temperature increases within within solar parks. Um, particularly when you have ground mounted installations in say 
um, hot semi-arid climates. Um, so we're looking at about three to four degrees um, increase in, in, in um, air temperature um, in a hot um, semi-arid environment and maybe two to five degrees um, in, in say a cold um, desert environment. Within an urban area, um, there's increasing consensus. Um, I would say that, um, that um, deployment in urban areas actually can serve to reduce um, the urban heat island effect, which is another one of these techno-ecological outcomes that can really provide, you know, great benefits, um, not only just um, with that, but something that um, is really important too for parking lots um, that that can provide a lot of important um, services to people and in, in their cars when when they get off of work or something. Um, and and so um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, one study that we're working on now is is exploring not only how solar energy development in arid lands impacts within uh, within surface temperatures within the actual park, but beyond that. So what we're seeing is that um, there is a the presence of a cool island that occurs beyond um, the the boundary of a um, of a uh, ground mounted installation up to 730 meters, so about 750 meters um, away from the solar park boundary. Um, and so um, this is all sort of an area of active research and um, a really important consideration when you think about uh, all of the um, environmental cues that can be impacted from those changes in both air temperature and land surface temperatures. And I'll ask a, a follow up question for you, Rebecca, we're interested in your comment on on how energy infrastructure um, might impact and changing energy infrastructure might impact um, marginalized and indigenous communities and wondered if you could say a bit more about, um, you know, how things like expanding renewable solar panel arrays might might impact um, communities in either a positive or, or negative way. Yeah, sure. I think one of the the most unfortunate side effects of renewable energy expansion and perhaps one that um, we don't often think about is that um, we don't really like to see uh, our renewable energy infrastructure. Um, it's very uh, industrial looking and we're finding that, you know, a lot of people, communities um, don't want to um, to see it in their view sheds. And, and so the, 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 what happens is, is that a lot of times um, our energy infrastructure gets what, what we call outsided. They get installed into areas that are really, really far from say where the, the um, credit for um, that particular power plant is given. And, and say, you know, maybe they're in the Silicon Valley and they're building a hundred megawatt installation, but they're locating it in Kern County, um, an area where community voices are, are very disenfranchised and, um, and, and people there are environmentally vulnerable. Um, and so the important thing is to um, think about how we can kind of reframe our, our brain into thinking about how renewable energy infrastructure within our communities, within our cities, is something that um, maybe we can get used to. Maybe we can um, look at it as an um, enhancement of the aesthetic value of the communities that we live in, because this is what will really um, underpin an increase in local energy, which will reduce transport, transmission costs and um, associated loss of energy. And, and so we're doing a lot of work on that front, looking at the um, how to facilitate local energy and prevent what we're calling outsiding on marginalized communities. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. I'll invite uh, Bill Hammond, another user board member, to, to ask a question. Hello. Uh, thanks, um, Rebecca. I, I had one more question um, about one of your slides, you showed um, some on water solar uh, floating there in a pond. And that started me thinking, and I'm, I'm wondering sort of what are the limits on that? And, and we have a lot of ocean that could be covered with solar panels. What if that were 
uh, utilized to the max and what are the limits on that? Is it, is it the transmission or is it the effect on wildlife or is it the expense or the harsh conditions? Could you say a couple of things about that? Sure, this is um, such a great topic right now in renewable energy. Um, there, it, what started as sort of this niche um, boutique market of solar just within the past year has just completely proliferated, um, you know, on the industry side and in the academic side. Um, we currently have a grant with the DOE looking at four particular, um, uh, four specific installations in the US. And the really amazing thing about them is that they're, they're so diverse. Um, one is a water treatment facility. One is the first floating uh, photovoltaic array in Farniente. Um, I'm sorry, in Napa, which is located at a winery called Farniente. Um, and then two are stormwater runoff um, reservoirs in Florida. Um, now, what are the barriers to development? Well, that's something that we're actually working on right now. Um, we don't know a lot about what the um, performance outcomes will be. Um, there's, there's considerations about soiling, specifically how birds might impact performance. Um, when you have water and sun combined, this is you know exactly what people add to um, create weathering experiments. So it's essentially this sped up weathering experiment on PV, um, which has implications for end of life considerations for the solar energy industry. Um, and then there's impacts on wildlife and impacts on potentially impacts on water. And so we're we're learning as fast as we can while development is also um, kind of racing forward. And um, but the one thing that we've we've noticed in the field is that um, the birds seem to be very uh, um, acceptable, uh, accepting of using the uh, floating solar infrastructure. Um, they use it to dry their feathers and to hunt, um, which surprised a lot of ornithologists when we um, showed that at a, a meeting. Um, so there's just, it's just a, a huge sort of open space that our frontier, I would say, in energy ecology, and, and we're learning as fast as we can. Thank you. I'd like to wrap this part of our, our meeting up with a big thank you to each of our speakers and panelists. And Garrett, thank you for joining in for our panel discussion. Um, this is really a, a fascinating and interesting discussion that just demonstrates the, the areas of, of research that are poised to be worked on as we think about the energy transition and all of the links between water and ecosystems and land use and justice and, and the work of the earth science community within that space. So thank you so much for your for your engagement and presentations. And I will pass it back to Isabel, our board chair for a final synthesis. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you to all our panelists, our speakers, uh, and, uh, including Brian Anderson, who I don't think is still with us and uh, for all of your questions. Um, so I, I would like to just uh, provide a, a brief uh, a synthesis of what I think we've heard today, uh, where some emerging opportunities, uh, the challenges and, and where uh, Beezer, for instance, might be uh, available to contribute. So we heard today that the future of energy systems in the US is one of decarbonized energy with the current administration setting the goals to eliminate emissions from power plants by 2035 and net zero emissions across all sectors by 2050. And to accomplish these goals, it's clear we need a very aggressive pathway forward with the optimal solutions if we're gonna reach that net zero economy, a uh, carbon economy by 2050. And in our efforts to do so, uh, building a reliable and resistant power grid is critical for driving a robust economy and national security. But this need, these needs need, must be matched by efforts to ensure affordable and abundant energy while enabling a just energy transition and environmental sustainability for all Americans. So we heard from all of our speakers, both exciting opportunities and major challenges in defining the pathways forward with optimal solutions, with much focus on Earth resource sustainability and minimizing environmental impacts. Solutions to the changes will require, as, as Becca Hernandez said, entire knowledge systems spanning multiple sectors, including the stakeholders, policy and decision makers, regulators, researchers, among others. And we heard that alternative energy sources will provide only about 50% 
of the carbon or CO2 savings. Thus, we'll need carbon removal methods and carbon storage opportunities, both of which will be critical uh, once we hit about 60% carbon decrease. We heard about the need for methane sequestration technologies that are just about coming on board. And we heard about transforma transformational CCS technologies, such as new polymers uh, and biosorbent materials for direct capture of CO2, even with a, a caught benefit of byproduct of blue uh, hydrogen. But there are challenges to this carbon. Uh, where are we going to store it in the subsurface? Uh, where it is sequestered safely and permanently. And obviously another key need, how will we drive down the costs of carbon capture uh, as Brian uh, discussed with us. Ben Houghton and Garrett Boudinet uh, introduced us to direct carbon capture that does not require fossil, -based, fossil fuel based energy. And uh, obviously from a lot of the questions, I think there was a lot of interest in that. Um, this has the potential on a global scale of two to 5 billion tons of CO2 removal. But clearly there, uh, the gap between the potential and deployment is very large. And they shared with us their findings from their Workings Land Innovation Center, um, where they're testing on a, on a fairly large scale the, uh, the potential of soil amendments to diverse croplands and rangeland, certainly showing us the uh, potential uh, as well as the co-benefits regarding the ecosystems and biomass yield. But as with all of these emerging energy technologies, these efforts require much more research to understand the life cycle uh, of carbon capture, that, that is the predictive rates of carbon capture, cost of availability of the necessary materials, upstream greenhouse gas and emissions and environmental impacts, uh, and then the incredible barriers to adoption of enhanced weathering in particular price point issues. Once again, it requires the collaboration of the suppliers the government, the farmers, the environmentalists, among others. Nicole Saunders uh, shared with us the opportunity for reuse of produce, produced water management um, and that has been conventionally re-injected into the subsurface, but with climate change and associated uh, other impacts has the potential for land applications, industry use and potential for drinking water. But she too has told us these opportunities are met with regulatory and protection gaps and uh, talk to us about all of those issues, including infrastructure ones. And we all appreciate the need for um, renewable energy sources. Uh, that will be a substantial and necessary component of the US future energy portfolio. But as Becca Hernandez indicated, energy sources use land, so much so that energy development in the US is now the largest driver of land use and land cover change. So a key question is how will we meet our future energy needs and strategies while protecting a sizable amount of land for food protection and sustainability and maintaining habitats for ecosystem services. And I think it's really interesting that we heard um, that when uh, solar energy, for instance, which can have a very large land footprint is integrated in existing infrastructure locally can incur zero additional land use and land cover changes. And she spoke to us of how the uh, different new installation strategies maximize techno-ecological synergies. We heard from our panelists and comments by our guests that solar and wind renewables, uh, reuse of wastewater streams, all involve challenges in seasonal variability and will require seasonal energy storage uh, research. And the sustainability of critical minerals um, and uh, rare earth elements is a major challenge we're facing as the demand to produce many of these critical minerals or materials uh, that are needed for carbon capture and sequestration and renewable energy is increasing and anticipated to continue to do so in the future. So to conclude, I come back to two common themes we heard today. That is that developing and applying these solutions and others that were not discussed today requires a full scale knowledge system. One that holistically considers the life cycle of the technologies and one that involves those players that produce the science and technology, those who will develop an aggressive energy policy and re regulation portfolio, as well as market strategies, actions, and the stakeholders who will be impacted both positively and negatively by the emerging energy technologies. So I'd like to thank again, Brian Anderson, Nicole Saunders, Rebecca Hernandez, Ben Holton, and Garrett Abudno for their time today. Uh, the discussion was greatly enriched by their insights. And I'd also like to thank each of you for joining us today 
and contributing your great questions. Thank you to uh, Jim Slutz and Brenda uh, Bowen, who were excellent moderators. And finally, as a reminder for all of you, the video of this meeting will be available on our website within the week. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.